Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, welcome to the webinar on Future Ready University in 90 Days. This is a live, this is a live webinar brought to you by Nitin, supported by our panel of distinguished speakers from international universities and edtech industry leaders. The speakers will be discussing about policy and the education landscape, emerging trend and readiness, transformation and technology, as well as case studies and plans to a future ready university through this very challenging time. The speakers we have lined up for you today are Mr. Leslie Lowe. Leslie is the CEO and founder of Litton, who is also the host of the event today. Professor Anil, Chairman of All India Council for Technical Education. Professor Claire Ozan, Vice Provost from the University of Roehampton, United Kingdom. Dr. Lili Chan, Chief Executive and Vice Chancellor of Wawasan Open University of Malaysia. Ms. Sandy Damowinoto, Vice Rector from the President University of Indonesia. Mr. Bharat Agrawal, President of the Vishwakarma University of India. Mr. Yang Lambrat, CEO and Founder of Epitome Global. Last but not least, Mr. Giri Dawat Nayak, CEO and founder of Sambash. So let me start with a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Please note that all the participants will be muted by default through the system. So you are encouraged to send us your questions in advance and specify which speaker your questions should be directed to. We will try our best to raise it during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You can find the Q&A function that is located at the top right-hand side of a WebEx browser or at the bottom of your WebEx message box. So without much ado, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Leslie Lowe. Leslie founded System Access as a one-man technology startup after graduation, and he had grew the business into a publicly listed global enterprise until it was acquired by a leading global financial services software provider in year 2006. So Leslie then founded Red Dot Ventures in 2012 to nurture and incubate tech startups in Singapore and around the region. It has to date that he invested in over 40 startups across a diverse sector and has since achieved multiple investment exits for his investment. In year 2016, Leslie became the CEO of Litton, one of his investing companies to accelerate its transformational journey to disrupt the adult education sector with skill-based blended learning pedagogies and innovative business models. So Leslie has selected the overall winner. Leslie was also selected as the overall winner of Singapore's ASME Rotary Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 1998 and received the National Youth Award for Entrepreneurship in year 1999. In year 2006, he was awarded the Person of the Year Award, especially in the IT Leader Award category by the Singapore Computer Society. Leslie has also served as a board and advisory panel member of various Singapore government agencies, including the Infocom Development Authority, the Spring Singapore, the Small Medium Enterprise Development Agency, IP Academy, National Research Foundation, Workforce Development Agency, Ministry of Education, to assist in charting the nation's economic strategies, Infocom manpower development, small medium enterprise and startup development, as well as adult education development for the small medium enterprises in Singapore. Now, without much ado, it is my pleasure to hand over the control to Leslie to start his presentation. Leslie, thanks. Um, welcome. Um, I'm glad to see many of you here. Um, so my session is going to talk about how you potentially can future ready your university in 19 days uh, in a post-COVID digital economy. Um, in way large or small, our lives have been changed by digital technology. The speed of change has been unprecedented and the transformation has been exponential. By some estimates, Change today is happening 10 times faster and 300 times the scale of the first industrial revolution. The change is so momentous 
that it is referred today as the fourth industrial revolution. It took 75 years for the telephone to reach 50 million users. However, it has taken Pokemon Go only 19 days to reach the same number of users. The tremendous speed of change could not have been driven by any specific technology. It's due to emergence of multiple digital technology, which is stacking on top of another to create tsunami of innovation that will be redefine the way we live, the way we work and learn. This tsunami is huge and no industry will be spared. If you stand still, you will be crushed. Let's look at this survey from Gartner. All industry will face disruption ranging from 63% for the highly physical sector, such as construction industry, to 88% for financial services sector, where product can be easily sold and deliver via the digital channel. Education is ranked second, where 86% of the sector could face disruption. It could be a blessing, or occurs depending on how you react to this change. Pure play digital disruptor, including Coursera and Udacity, will be breathing down our neck with their almost free e-learning offering. If you do not do something to fight back, they will just take our lunch, but also our dinner. There is a skill shift given this digital revolution. And with COVID-19, the change will accelerate. How would the COVID-19 outbreak affect this digital transformation? The COVID-19 outbreak since January have made us readjust our lives in way most of us never imagined. For those who are fortunate to still have a job, Home is now office and doubles as a classroom for those with children. In Singapore, COVID-19 has advanced digital transformation effort over last eight weeks, equivalent to what has been achieved with the multi-billion dollar Smart Nation initiative over the last five years. And digital divide has now crossed the chasm with everyone shifting to working and learning online. Access and ability to work online has become a must, and those who are, not, who are unable to connect and work online will fall behind economically. If advances in technology are the catalyst for the current digital transformation, COVID-19 has given that final push for it to cross the line where it has become a must do for businesses to survive in the post-COVID economy. This particular statistic, this chart, reflect the way that skill will change in the digital economy. In 10 years time, most work, you would need technology skill. In fact, half of the hours that you spend on your job would require technology skill. That's given, as we all know. But it's more than just technology skill that will increase in importance in the new digital economy. It also includes skill, such as social and emotional skill, innovation skill, entrepreneurship skill. These are 21st century soft skill that would be required to augment technology skill to in, be involved in creating value rather than add value. The future look, workplace will look very different. For the first time, we have five generations of worker working in one place, from the baby boomer to the Gen Z, the millennia. And although they are very, very different, 
but they would have to work together. But with the amounts of percentage of millennia in the workforce, the workplace would be very different because millennia and Gen Z work very differently. They see things differently. And clearly technology would continue to advance and robot already make many jobs obsolete and it would get even smarter and it would take over many jobs. Everything will be on demand. Everything can be shared as you have already experienced. How you take a cab, how you study, and it all has changed. With COVID-19, when we sell something or deliver something, the channel that we use would likely be digital. There's no other choice. In the digital economy, you need differentiation. Innovation rule. It's only through innovation that you could stay competitive. The market is changing. There are disruption of intermediary. Consumer is rising. And clearly, this would require more direct connection between the product manufacturer and the consumer. Is education industry able to keep up with this change? And conventional education, we all know has issue. Fundamentally, there are two issues which we all are quite familiar with, poor outcome and low return on investment. It's poor outcome because a lot of our focus is about delivering knowledge. And generally, it's far from the minds of education provider to deliver tangible outcome an individual or a business need. In the new digital economy, the consumer, the learner, the enterprises is looking at solution an outcome, a job, a, a business capability. Training is only a part of that journey. So how do we create solution that deliver that outcome for them? Re low return on investment. The tuition fee is not the most expensive pace of uh, part of the investment. What is really expensive? It's really that opportunity cost. Can you imagine? You go to school for four years and you are not working a single day during that four years. It's the high opportunity cost for not working that is making it very expensive. And I think there are solutions to solving that problem. In Asia, there's been a transformation. And over the last five to six years, various country across the region is changing. And that change is not necessarily to solve the learning mode issue. I think that's only one of the issue. The main issue that I outline is actually the, the skill issue, the work readiness issue. And learning mode, how we deliver it, whether online or offline, it's only a, a median on which that we solve this problem. If we just solve the problem of delivering mode, it would not be good enough. And many in the many country recognize that. Many seen how successful the Swiss and the German model has been in terms of their apprentice type of system, where they really deliver work ready graduate before they even finish their school. So Singapore, uh, Asia likewise has been undergoing that transformation. Singapore is probably first out of the block with what they call the Skill Future Initiative. It's a $15 billion initiative when it was launched to essentially integrate applied learning within the entire education system. From the very young primary school, they now learn about design thinking, coding, and that will be integrated across the board. Instead of a six-month internship that the poly 
the student have to go through a three months. Now it's essential, it can be as long as a year. Singapore, since 2016, across the board, applied learning implementation has been changing the landscape in Singapore. Malaysia made an announcement in 2018, a, a 4.9 billion Malaysian ringgit announcement with a pivot master plan to transform, to move toward using the competency, the applied learning framework. And in 2019, China essentially put designated $15 billion to transform their traditional academic university to become university of applied sciences. And many more countries, which I'm not, I have not stated here, and we would have the privilege for our academia speaker to actually share the type of applied learning transformation that is happening across Asia. Clearly, the industry know that, and that transformation is going on. In Singapore, in 2015, Singapore launched what you call the Future Economy Committee. The committee meant to transform Singapore to become a smart nation. And there are 23 sectors that would be given a prescription of how businesses should change and what type of skill and workforce jobs that they should deliver. And education sector is obviously one of it. And so in Lytton, at that time, was just an education, um, SME education provider in Singapore. In fact, all this disruption that we are getting is we were on the same boat. Our traditional business was threatened when digital education business such as Coursera and Udacity, General Assembly, started to encroach in our business. These digital learning startups were extremely well-funded, having raised several hundred millions of dollars. Litton was then only a conventional SME offering classroom-oriented adult education program in Singapore. We are fortunate that Singapore launched the Skill Future Initiative and the Future Economy Initiative to transform our nation. I was personally appointed by Skill Future Singapore, which is an agency that uh, uh, mandated to come up with a blueprint to support the transformation of the educa education sector to co-chair a committee. The committee task was how we can transform our conventional classroom oriented training, how we can change the fundamental of education business so that we can scale and grow in the new digital economy. And I was the co-chair, 18 months later, we released the sector transformation plan called TAESTP which subsequently become part of the training and adult education industry transformation map in Singapore. You could go to the internet, you could pick up the industry transformation map for Singapore, and you will see many of the features outlined in the transformation map is what we implemented in our solution. With the pool of multi-billion dollars investment from our government, the push from global digital education disruptor, and the need to eat our own dog food, given that we have created the plan, Litton took the transformation prescription from the committee, allocate 10 million US dollar, and implemented wholesale end to end, started in 2015. And the plan talked about several major trends that we're supposed to solve the issue. We need to leverage on technology so that learning can be more effective. We need to deliver learning that meet business outcome. That's really the key uh, fundamental needs for the outcome that we need to deliver. Learning that deliver 
tangible business outcome for individual is about a career induction, not just training. For businesses, it's about digital transformation for the businesses as the outcome for the training. And a lot of this training would likely have to happen at the workplace. And clearly, the educator in Singapore would correspondingly need to be transformed to be able to take on that role as an enabler to support the, the different ways of teaching, different ways of delivering education services. So I would like to share with you our transformation plan, and we took a holistic approach in that transformation plan. Um, and there were three imperatives in our transformation plan. Firstly, we needed to digitalize learning that deliver career and business outcome. Secondly, we need to ensure that we have a connected campus that support online to offline engagement, that deliver a work to learn journey. I'll elaborate a little bit more. The new business model, the connected workplace campuses would need to be supported by an agile ecosystem that enable business scalability for the business. So I will attempt to go into each of those imperatives and share our experience on what we have done. So our business model can be best illustrated by this particular methodology created by Dublin, which was adopted by Deloitte. And there's a book behind this, it's called 10 Type of Innovation. The 10 Type of Innovation essentially say, you Today, you cannot be competitive as a business unless you are able to deliver multiple innovation. A single innovation unlikely is enough for you to compete and differentiate. So typically business have 10 areas within the company that they can innovate. The core of their business got to be their offering, their core offering. With the right offering, they need to deliver the seamless experience that businesses or individual need, their customer need. And to enable that to scale, they must have the configuration, the structure, the process, the finance in order to deliver it in scale. So, so what the um, lead and do in terms of creating that product. So our view is that we really can't be a pure play. We can't be a Coursera, right? We are a physical, traditional, face-to-face -face delivery training provider, like many of you. But we really can't go the other side. And same like if you are a retail business today, you can't possibly go out there and say you want to compete with Amazon. So we have to go online to offline. It's really a question about how much of this off online component that we can digitize, how much of this offline component within that value chain of our business that we can digitalize. And the more you can do, the probably more disruptive your offering can be. But we believe it got to be a mix because the Coursera, the Udemy, didn't do justice either on their pure play delivery. We all know completion rate has been extremely low at 3%. And to, we have to have a much higher completion rate, much better outcome. There lies the need to continue to have that physical interaction, as well as the online interaction. So it needs to be an online to offline business. And the first strategy that will be very critical for any businesses, certainly for Litton, was that how can we actually deliver that solution that individual and customer need? I spoke about individual look for career induction, enterprises look for digital transformation. And we can't just deliver training to do that. So we need to bundle multiple products to do that. And you need 
there are multiple innovations that deliver that disruptive offering. I think as a traditional business, we all have certain constraints, particularly that physical constraint. Uh, we have to find a way to remove that physical constraint in whatever that we do, whether it be selling, delivering, and teaching. And so that's fundamentally how you can digitize your product and services. And all businesses, including university, and university clearly is more of that than most others, particularly academic university. They need to own the resources. They need to have build building. They need to have their own full-time lecturer. But the new world doesn't need that. I think university need to be more agile. They need to be able to outsource where they can. So on-demand resources is going to be a key part of that strategy. So we talk about blended learning. We, we were Coursera, the Udemy. It's about massification of education. It's free, but it can be delivered to a million people. Face-to-face, -face, traditional education, is about, about direct, smaller scale. I think we need to deliver mass customization for learning. To do that, technology can help you to massify the delivery, but it cannot help you to personalize that journey. So therefore, you must have combination of digitalization using technology, as well as innovative pedagogy that augment the technology that deliver mass customization and mass customization by corporate collaborative learning. So this is a transformation map uh, of which um, the committee that I co-chair came up with. Uh, there are various pieces. This is just one of the piece uh, about innovation, business innovation. We need to integrate training with business solutioning or consulting or mentoring so that we can deliver tangible solution, business outcome, business performance, industry transformation. We need to have pedagogy that essentially are able to deliver this outcome that's effective. So in short, actually the pedagogy is a blended learning pedagogy, work-based learning, mentor-led delivery, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So as I said, we adopt the blueprint wholesale in our delivery. So our solution is called Competency Learning as a Service. It's an on-demand learning and mentoring platform. There are essentially three fundamental principles to our design. First, the starting point would always be it needs to be relevant. It need to deliver the skill and the competency required by the industry and employer. It's not just that multidisciplinary skill. It need to deliver on that 21st century broad competency that enable that individual to create value rather than add value. So all our, all our programs are all aligned, accredited with the competency framework in Singapore, which in any case is modeled after the Australian and the UK competency framework. Secondly, it needs to be deliver work integrated because the highest cost of learning is actually staying inside the classroom. So if you can turn that learning, that learn through work, it's not that you are going to, it's not just reducing the cost, but also increase the outcome, the experience that you get, the ability at the same time to reduce the cost. So our learning pedagogy, which I would like to share with you how it works, is called Work Integrated Applied Learning. Given the journey is going to be strutted across work, classroom, at home, and it needs to be blended. And more importantly, it needs to be designed in a way that able to deliver personal 
that can be personalized to an individual. Because if a person, if you need to integrate your learning into a person's work, it's unlikely that you can find everybody is doing the same thing. So you have to be able to, in some way, customize your learning journey for individual uh, in, individual. So firstly, competency-based curriculum, as I said, all our curriculum are credited by the Singapore Competency Framework. And we all know that learner, particularly Asian, they love to have a degree. A skill certification is not good enough. So what we did is we make our curriculum deliver interoperable credential. The learner will walk away, not just skill certification or technical certification by technology vendor, but also academic equivalent of, of accreditation. So therefore, we will be able to have an interoperable credential that combines skills and the academic vigorous in terms of transferable knowledge in an individual. So we have this uh, framework called um, EASE, e -A -S -E. essentially our learning can happen through self-paced self e-learning. Learning can, can be many activity. What we refine as activity is live activity. It could be a live lecture, flip class, mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring. There are also community support. And finally, we can't uh, do without certainly assessment. And the way that we have designed our system, we have been able to put a lot of this learning component as learning object. It's almost like a Lego brick that you can string them together, that you can configure your learning journey to support a specific individual in their work to learn journey. And the work integrated learning would require more than just disseminating information in the classroom. A big part of the learning, we believe, would have to be through on-the-job experience, through mentoring and coaching. I'm sure many of you out there as educators are familiar with the 70-20-10. So a big part of our learning journey, in fact, a small percentage of 10-20% is really in the classroom. The rest are all at the workplace. Get mentor and uh, learn through work. So our four years degree program, there's only one year that they work full time, they study full time in the first year. Second, third, fourth, they study, they work full time, study part time. And in fact, many of that study part time is actually get embedded into real life project at work. Therefore, they would not have to spend a lot of the time outside the workplace, which will be invasive to an individual's uh, um, personal commitment. So this is what we call work-based learning and learning that deliver KSA, knowledge, skill, ability. We always start with delivering that conceptual knowledge through combination of e-learning and flip class, but that doesn't allow them necessarily to deliver outcome. They need to know how to apply that and when they apply that concept successfully, they could potentially deliver an outcome. So our learning pedagogy is that after they have learned the, the after they have, the, during that conceptual stage, we'll be doing things not very different from what university would do. Uh, E-learning combined perhaps with flip class in a 25, 30 students setting. But what's really different is that after they have gained that concept, they would actually pick up a real life project and we break them down into small group where they would be given an industry mentor that mentor them on the application of that concept in a real life project. If that real life project result in a successful execution that deliver business outcome, that's how the business outcome would be delivered to businesses. And with execution on one or two projects on that concept, do not 
master get that learner to master their skill and our on-demand mentor will follow them to the workplace and mentor them on continuous application of the concept to multiple projects therefore gain mastery skill uh, at the workplace so over the last many years we have invest significantly in creating a curriculum that enable us to support end-to-end -end digital skill needs of the modern enterprises. In the modern enterprises, businesses need to have not just tech skill, but in fact, most of it is actually like tech skill in a business setting. An accountant, in the past, the technology skill that he need, he or she need, was spreadsheet, and that were, was probably good enough for his job. But today, if you want to be an accountant, and if you do not know data analytics with enough depth, you're unlikely going to get a job as an accountant. If you are a risk manager, if you do not know data scientist, science in depth, you're unlikely going to get a job as a risk manager. So many of these future jobs have now require deep technical digital innovation skill embedded into the job. So many of these jobs have become a hybrid of business domain and digital skill. So we have created over 20 over qualification, 100 over modules that enable us to deliver skills for technical professional as well as business professional. So I just want to share with you one program. Uh, it's called an applied bachelor program for software engineering. So what we do is that when they join our program, they go into a full-time bootcamp, 12 months. It's not a three hours a day, uh, day that they would get in the conventional university. They would come in at nine o'clock, they'll finish at uh, six o'clock, and they do that 12 months during the first year. And what we do is we front load skill into these 12 months. And these 12 months include six of the month, they are involved in doing offshore projects with international company. So through that, on the 13th month, they will be work ready. When they are work ready, they will start working full time as apprentice to the employer that we place with them. Many of them are international employer from Singapore and they will work for three years. So the outcome for this journey would be in short that they would get inducted into their digital career three years before they graduate. They are paid typically double or triple compared to academic graduate. I'll give you an example in a case that we have validated in Myanmar. In Myanmar, if you are an IT graduate from a conventional university, you make 250 US dollars. Our graduate makes 750 US. Generally, because of two reasons. First, they have three years of full stack software development experience. Secondly, they have a global ready skill. We all know that in countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, particularly this non-English speaking country, if you have that technical skill and uh, good communication skill, able to speak good English, therefore able to take on offshore project, your salary double. So how do we instill this global ready skill? So when they check into our campus, they don't check into a Myanmar campus. They are physically in Myanmar campus, physical campus, but when they check into the class, they check into a global virtual campus. In the virtual global campus, their classmates will be from around the world. And they would be working together, collaborating, sharing, and certainly speaking in English to do joint projects. Through that, they acquire this 21st century soft skill, collaboration, sharpen their communication skill, Therefore, being able to be so-called future-ready uh, talent uh, when they graduate. Given that they can work for three years, 80% of the cohort would make more money 
than what they have to pay for the tuition fee. And in fact, we are so confident about what we deliver, we guarantee certain income. This is to cater for the bottom 20% of the cohort, which might not be able to get that salary validation from the employer. And we will guarantee that 50% of the fee would actually be uh, guaranteed. If the learner do not make uh, be, um, beyond the uh, minimum guarantee, we will actually top up the difference. So that's undergraduate. For postgraduate, we see that differently. And most university postgraduate tend to target individual. But our view is postgraduate should be targeting not just individuals who want to upskill themselves, perhaps do a better job, but also enterprises who want to transform their workforce. And all enterprises today, certainly those in Singapore, and I'm sure across the region as well, they all need to transform. So there's a great need in transforming the workplace, the workforce. So therefore, we create micro-credentials, stackable micro-credentials in the form of postgraduate certificate, of which this credential, when stacked together, it become a diploma. Two of the credentials stacked together will become a diploma, postgraduate diploma, if it's three of them, it become a master degree. So we are not just delivering that skill that they need. More importantly, our mentor-led learning enable us to put a mentor to support the enterprises with business insight to support the transformation because the industry practitioner would be dedicated to a company who send more than five people to the class and they would get that dedicated mentor that would help to guide their team in that transformation of the business. So therefore, the businesses are not just getting a training. They are actually getting a consultant that work with their trainer that deliver that tangible outcome for them. So if you look at in terms of solution, I was talking about coupling and bundling solution. So we are bundling a training solution with a job placement solution so that they can get inducted into their career on the 13th month. For the postgraduate, we bundle with a consulting mentor that provide that insight, that work with their training so that they can actually facilitate a digital transformation that lead to that business outcome. So it's going back to the customer want a solution. We need to be able to create a bundling of the product that deliver that solution rather than just the knowledge that which do not this day actually is, is almost free. So the first section is about how do you actually create a solution that are competitive, disruptive, uh, that to compete. So I've gone through that. I think we have a product that has been validated. Um, but it needs to be supported by technology. So our, we envision the campus of the future are a connected online to offline campus. So this online to offline campus would have integrated digital technology that enable that seamless outside in learning operation support. We would have a connected online to offline collaborative learning platform that support that work to learn journey. And this campus would leverage on, on demand technology that deliver as a service. So this is our le work to learn journey. As I said, the first 12 months they'll be on a bootcamp. The first six months is really about skill bootcamp. Second six months is about few induction, but it happened in, in the on campus because the project will be done as an offshore project with an international company. Then they go to the market and they would get attached to the industry and they can work inside the company where they got attached to physically, or they actually stay on campus. 
And because the campus would become a co-working space for the enterprise that engage this learner. So there are a lot of technology that's needed that need to be laid across the campuses to support that outside in journey. To start is sales and marketing. So there are technology like Omnicommerce Webfront, uh, digital sales and marketing engagement, and certainly in terms of tech enable operation, it should start from career and course planning all the way to application and enrollment to student management. Businesses need to be more intelligent and learning analytic, virtual mentor, and clearly the entire campus need to be laid on top of a digital uh, campus with unified communication capability. Uh, my colleague, uh, the EdTech, uh, with EdTech Solution, um, Sambash will talk about the AI mentor, the virtual AI mentor, how it could effectively support blended learning. Yuan will talk about specifically on working analytics on how you can better support career and course planning for the learner. So this is a technology that uh, um, we have put together. Uh, to support our learning journey. As you can see, our learning journey starts from self-paced e-learning to instructor-led flip class to small group mentoring to one-to-one -to -one support. It's a complex process and we need technology to manage that learning journey, which one of our, my, our colleague would actually be sharing with you more on exactly how this technology can be used to support that blended learning journey. So technology is the easiest part for our transformation, in fact, for Lytton, right? For the business modeling, it wasn't difficult for me because, you know, as you know, looking at my background, I've been a tech entrepreneur all my life. I invested in 40 tech startups. So I'm very familiar with a uh, startup model and the technology that is needed. So that's the first two imperatives. The third part, uh, my own transformation experience, this is probably the most painful part, right? We need to change people. We need to change our faculty. We need to make them more agile. We need to let go of the physical infrastructure that we have and adopt an agile infrastructure. So these are the trends. 90% of organizations are de redesigning jobs and 32% are doing substantially. Future workforce will be structured more by project rather than by job function. More than half for all employees will require significant rescaling and upscaling. 85% of business plan to increase their use of independent freelancer. So the trend really points to there need to be plenty of job redesign, workforce rescaling, and certainly looking at resources beyond permanent ownership but rather into the gig economy. So future learners are generally multidisciplinary. They need to have an innovative skill. They need to be agile and certainly digital ready. In order to have all those agility, multidisciplinary skill, digital skill, clearly they need to be a lifelong learner. And Individuals need to be multidisciplinary and T-shaped. They need to have broad competency. They also need multiple deep skills. An accountant would need data analytics. An accountant that do not know how to implement an ERP system, unlikely is going to keep, keep his job. So what Litton did is that, in fact, the first thing we did when we started the transformation is a lot of redesigning of work because we need to make the team smaller because if it's smaller, it's more agile, it's faster. And when you're trying to make it smaller, effectively, that same individual needs to have more skill. So like, for example, a salesperson, when they sell in the digital economy, is very different from a traditional business sales. Because sales is marketing, marketing is sales in a digital transaction. And therefore, a sales manager would be, need to be half a digital marketer. So 
a faculty who deliver would probably need to be a designer and also a learning manager, all roll into one. So through this redesign, as well as uberizing of that whole workforce, and for us, it certainly suits us fine because we want industry practitioner. And if they are hired by us, they're unlikely to become a practitioner after a while. So we want them current. We want them to be working somewhere else and they will become an adjunct faculty when we need them to deliver. So, so that's what we have gone through um, in terms of redesigning the faculty to deliver the type of agility that's needed. So we have uh, transformed as a business. We believe that we have a great product, uh, a product that can deliver tangible business outcome. Uh, we also have technology that able to support this innovative product. Uh, more importantly, we also have set up an ecosystem that leveraging on this technology, this industry practitioner across the region, and we are pulling this together and we can't do it on our own, we believe, going into each of the country. We want to work with university. So what we propose to do is we would partner with university in each of these country and we will jointly set up what we call a class academy. And this academy would deliver digital innovation program for both undergraduate as well as postgraduate. But in order for us to do that, we need to set up a talent and a learning ecosystem. And if you look at this platform, it needs to be including all the stakeholders that support this co collaborative learning ecosystem. The first block obviously is the student and the adult learner. The second is actually the employer and the enterprises. Thirdly, it's actually the educator, like the industry expert, as well as the technology that would need to support that learning journey. And university is a big part of that ecosystem. And the university and the government, frequently you won't, unless you get that course accredited with the university, you won't get the funding. So the funding, in a way, the government get involved with the university to deliver uh, that, that funding as well as the, 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 the campuses, the credential, the trust that the market needs. So how do we work together? So we believe that it needs to be collaboration between university, Litton, as well as the employer and enterprises. Because in that work learning the journey, it's strata between campuses as well as the workplace. We need to bring together not just a learner on one side, but also the employer and the enterprises on the other side. What we need to do is to provide that seamless connection between learning and the consumption of the skill in the industry. And we make it seamless. What we did by basically getting the employer to hire this learner as an apprentice on the 13th month. Essentially, we are bringing the employer to not just provide the environment for them to, to acquire their work experience, but also the funding that come along to support that learning journey. So essentially, um, we believe that with for countries that don't need regulation, uh, don't need the accreditation of the course and etc., everything is on demand. And it can be delivered in 90 days. There lies the title of our talk is about how can we actually transform a university in 90 days? It's actually by combining our capability, work together um, to be able to launch it as soon as the September intake. So the program offering with this class academy that we jointly set up within the university would have to be not just providing training for higher education, 
but also for the adult learner and the enterprises. There lies what the university offer would be more than just an applied work study degree for undergraduate, but also a digital upscaling and career transition for postgraduate and a digital transformation and just in time talent for enterprises. Technically, we are actually a talent provider. We incubate talent for, em for employer who want to come into our ecosystem. In fact, we are very fortunate that uh, we sit in Singapore because Singapore has a great shortage of software talent, technical talent, and Singapore will be short of 40,000 IT professionals in the next few years. And that's why we are setting up, there is a demand for this talent in Singapore because there are not enough of them and they are 10 times, six to 10 times more expensive than our neighbor. So what we need to do is to work with you as university to incubate this talent, to supply this talent to this employer in Singapore. And therefore, as a business, we are actually a talent provider to these enterprises. So this is our product, as I said. When we go to the enterprise, we don't talk about just training, which is our class. We talk about implementing the technology and the solution in the enterprise, as well as the delivering of talent just in time to support their business. So what we envision with working together with you as our local university partner, we envision an applied lifelong university for the digital economy. This university would deliver future ready skill, such as innovation skill, technology skill, and digital skill. And the university provide lifelong learning from higher education to continuous education. Our learning deliver tangible skill utilization at the workplace. So therefore, the learning pedagogy would have to be highly industry relevant with a mentor-led work-based learning delivery. And the journey would have to be structured between the classroom and the workplace. And the workplace can also be on campus with the outsourcing model. And by combining our credential, our skill certification credential, your degree credential, local degree credential. In fact, we are also talking to Western University that could also, on top of that, provide international degree credential. Therefore, learner could walk away with credential that not just structure between a local recognized credential, but also international and as well as the skill certification. Credential. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that I have done justice uh, in terms of sharing with you what it takes to transform. Our own experience has been, it wasn't a walk in the park as I envisioned. Given my background as a tech entrepreneur, as an IT person, as a startup investor, I walk in into the transformation process with it's actually some arrogant, but it wasn't a walk in the park because um, it's holistic. When you're trying to do things holistically, there are many moving blocks. And as I said, the easier piece is not the technology because it's all working, all available. It's not even the learning pedagogy, but it's really getting the team to be able to deliver that in a super short time so so that was the the challenge that we have but we get through that and we hope that whatever that we have done as a company uh, we could work with you and go through that journey with you without the same pain that we have gone through because we have taken most of the pain and um, therefore we could do that quicker faster uh, more cost efficient with you to transform your business. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and thank you, Leslie, for the very comprehensive insight to the role of higher institution and its faculty in a converging economy, so as well as the opportunity in preparing its graduate to be job ready in a highly competitive global marketplace. 
I would like to now introduce our EdTech speaker who will be talking mm -hmm. about solutions that they have developed that will create innovative disruptions, redefine the way we learn, and created fundamental change to the future of lifelong learning. So our first EdTech speaker is Mr. Yang Landrat. He's the CEO and founder of Epitome Global. Epitome is a workforce analytics company that focused mainly on preparing workforces for the fourth industrial revolution. So today, to date, Epitome actually has already developed several transitional projects at the national, private, industrial, and institutional level by providing policy makers and industrial conglomerates the analytics they need to perform effective planning for short-term and long-term strategy. So Yang has 18 years of entrepreneurial career spanning five continents and was one of the early enablers of server-based cloud computing for enterprises. Yang has also co-founded some commercial cloud storage platform between the late 90s and to the mid 20s. He was also an award winner of the Endeavor Entrepreneur in October 2018. So it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Yang. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is uh, Jan Lambrink. Obviously, I'm not from Asia, but uh, I'm originally from Belgium. I moved a few decades ago to Asia, and I've never returned back. I've been living in um, India, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, etc., etc. Um, Epitome is a lifelong learning organization with a focus on human development. We are trying to find identity and purpose for everybody in the world, because if you think back about it, and we are, um, if we go back in history, and I'm just talking about 2019, December, we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, like elaborated by Leslie uh, quite a bit. And we, we all know it's coming. We, we all know that 50% of the jobs we know today will disappear within five years. We all know that 85% of the jobs in 2030 still haven't been uh, uh, invented yet. And this is then the moment that the pandemic uh, happened, and this fourth industrial revolution has been fast forwarded drastically. So whatever we were preparing for and whatever we thought we were preparing for is now in effect. So we have now, you know, online assessment uh, portals that we have to push out, online learning that we have to push out, online training management systems that we have to push out because we were caught in speed. So this is where we try to play a role in. How do you make your workforce employable? How do you make your graduates more employable for the future? How do you create a lifelong learning mindset in all your students and in all your graduates so that you don't only prepare them for life after the university, but also for the life in their career and all the steps they have to take there? And before I start into the solution, if we can click for the next slide, I want to show you some data this is gathered from our portal so this was done in the beginning of 2020 january when the pandemic was not hitting that hard yet and what we found out is that only 21 percent of the top right of the asian undergraduates graduates and early job career job seekers are in alignment with their career so they totally love and they know what to expect after their learning and when they go into the workforce but that's only 21%. If you now aggregate that results a little bit and you go a higher level on this, if you do workforce planning for a country, you would expect 100 engineers to come out. But no, there is actually only 21 engineers coming out. All the rest need some intervention points to help them and to make sure that we can help them progress in their life after studying or in their career. And some of these things can be very simple. Sometimes it's a matter of matching an individual to an internship program so he understands the job better that he has to do after his studies. Sometimes it's an apprenticeship. Sometimes it's matching with a mentor or a coach or somebody in the alumni. But this is something that we have to address. And this is what we are addressing with our platform, which is catering automated individual career services per student or a graduate that will be coming on our platform. So if you look into the, the, the next slide, um, what we are offering basically, it's not an LMS, it's a learning experience platform where we look in each phase that the student is. So from the moment they come to the university, are they choosing the right chapters for them? Are they choosing the right topics for them? 
all the way up to alumni. The moment you hit your workforce, this is becoming now an interesting problem to have. When we go to the workforce, we need to ensure that our graduates have a lifelong learning mindset. Because where our parents, um, they probably worked 20 to 30 years into one company and doing the same job, that is going to drastically change. Our kids, they will probably have to do six, seven, five, six, seven major career switches in their life. That's why that lifelong learning mindset is extremely important. This is where the role of universities and higher uh, education uh, colleges is going to be extremely important that they capture the alumni as well because the ones that are going to the workforce need to be upskilled continuously as well. So we believe that one of the key differentiators today for higher education schools and for universities is employability, which is going to be a major key um, um, differentiator even now. If you can provide data of long-term job placement and career progress, that would be extremely interesting for everybody. So um, if you look into the, the next slide, this is then how we would be starting. Um, we would be starting very simple because what I'm talking to is quite big and quite grand, but there is like very small steps that we can take together to go to that common goal, guaranteeing employability of our students. Is the first thing would be the catalyst profiling. Getting aligned to your career path and, and course of study starts with, with understanding your basic career interests and your general competencies. If, if you don't know what those are, our platform advanced can then recommend a range of suitable career options and courses or internships or apprenticeships or mentors or coaches or whoever it is that you need to talk at a certain moment and we will connect them uh, to you. Now, one of the very, very important parts um, that, we are, that we are seeing is we need to start, what, what do we need to be employable? over time. It's not going to be about your degree and your experience anymore. It's going to be about your mindset and your competence. So if we go to the next slide, the advanced portion of our solution is a suite and it's called um, Epitome Actualize. But the very important part for higher education and universities to look now into is the demand portion. It's the companies, the CEOs, the startups, the scale-ups that invent the jobs of the future and the skills of the future, basically. They know what they need to survive the next three to five years. We see now, because we have a lot of companies entering our portal, they have a few issues. Number one, they're still hiring based on CV, and that is an instrument that doesn't work anymore. Number two, they are having struggled, they're struggling with the fact that when they hire graduates, they have to invest in training, upskilling, reskilling, unlearning, learning those graduates, and only after six to 12 months or even longer those new graduates will bring relevance to the job. And that's actually totally crazy because that is something that you, as a higher education institution or university, can take control of. If you can match the competence of your graduates towards the needs of the new workforce, then you win because then those um, companies will hire faster and the new um, 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 the, the, the students that will enter the job will be faster employable, will be um, uh, generating uh, work for their new employers uh, way faster than before. So this is uh, where we want to go to. Um, we need to really start delivering the workforce of the future based on the skills that are needed by the enterprises and the startups and the scale-ups that are in the regions of the schools. So I think I did it a bit faster than 10 minutes, but I didn't want to drill too much into detail. So I'm um, looking forward for all your questions, and um, if you guys would like to have a demo, you can contact us as well. Uh, so we set up a demo for you on how you can see that a student will come in. We profile, we look into their values, their interests, their preferences, we look into their employability skills, we do an English assessment, we do an ICT assessment, whatever it is, and we have a total understanding of this particular student on how he learns and who he is. Then, when we have some of the companies coming in saying these are the skills or these are the trends that we're seeing in employability, um, then we can start doing that matching and that's where then the third part of our solution comes in, coach, which is then a personalized, adaptive, responsive um, learning management system basically where we match content to your graduates to be more employable over time. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Yang. I think that's very interesting and very impressive about your end-to-end -end way of analyzing a student's ability, learning ability, and match it with competency services to ensure employability going forward. That's excellent. Our next um, education technology speaker is Mr. Giri Danayak. Giri is actually the CEO and founder of Sambash based in Singapore. And uh, it has been helping education institutions get ready for future of learning with its flagship product. Sambash has helped education institutions deliver the pedagogy of blended learning in a personalized, consistent, complete, and affordable manner to help students with intelligent intervention for enhanced learning outcomes. Giri is involved in preschool education as well through the Ramakrishna Mission Sarada Kindergarten, a preschool which has been recognized as a role model kindergarten in Singapore for early childhood development. Previously, he was also the CTO at Sangat Ambit. Um, Mr. Giri, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Joel, for the kind introduction. Um, it was very interesting to listen from Jan on how workplace uh, placement is uh, changing and how data-driven systems uh, uh, is going to change uh, the entire way the, the, the entire way the systems of placement works and the way the students have been skilled. Uh, before I go into uh, talking about Mentor, I would like to just uh, catch back with what Leslie was uh, sharing in terms of uh, future of workplace, which also resonates with what Jan was talking about. So it's very important to note that most of uh, the skills that are required in the future would be automated to robots. And uh, one of the other key attributes would be everything on demand. And uh, more importantly, that Lethan has also been dog footing itself. And this is where OmniMentor comes into the place where uh, one of the challenges of, uh, or many of the challenges of uh, uh, blended learning was being addressed to OmniMentor. So before we go into uh, details of what OmniMentor is all about, uh, let us just take a back seat and understand what happens in the blended learning journey, uh, which is uh, so different from a conventional education system, which is uh, typically driven through a classroom uh, based uh, pedagogy where a teacher or a set of teachers come in and teach subjects. So in a blended learning journey, what typically happens is uh, uh, the three attributes, knowledge, skills, and ability. For class, uh, uh, to acquire knowledge, um, the basic uh, uh, building block is a set of e-learning modules or a set of e-learning instruction units, which is then combined with a sort of formative assessments, followed or, in, or interjected with flipped class where you have uh, 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 instructors or, and, uh, or the industry uh, mentors coming in and helping out with clarifications and uh, knowledge-based sharing that happens. So this is how a typical uh, model gets executed in a formative stage, where a set of e-learning components gets uh, combined into uh, or is basically constructed by many instructor units, and uh, it is then delivered via an online self-paced learning system. At the end of a module, you are actually assessed for skills, and there, that's when the student or the learner then goes down into the mode of getting mentored, and here you have an set of uh, actors come into place. So the industry mentors who come in and help in terms of imparting real life project skills. Something that Jan was uh, alluding to in terms of the gap that may exist between what uh, a learner would have uh, from his academic year, a learning, a learning experience versus what would be different in terms of a blended learning experience that deepens and impart. So herein you have mentors coming in and helping out with real life projects that gets delivered. And there is again uh, a, um, a mix and match of uh, online learning with online support and sometimes in-person support comes to place. So in other words, you have online to offline and offline to online coming to place, which means the engagement mode uh, is, is uh, driven across multiple channels. So this is one of, this is the key thing of what blended learning is all about. Another aspect of blended learning is to ensure that you overcome the limitations of a physical classroom environment where a physical teacher can only take X number of students in a given duration. So in the blended learning, since you allow the students to be e-learning by themselves, you are able to have the same content being delivered across, um, the, uh, across the online channels and you can scale up the delivery of the classes, which means you can scale up the number of qualifications and the number of modules that you can run concurrently within a given span of time. Hence, you can actually scale your ability to deliver the classes. So this is the first 
uh, advantage of dental line that comes into play. The next one that we look at is uh, how does it make it very collaborative? So blended learning involves not just the instructor or not just replacing the teacher with the instructor. There can be multiple instructors coming in in terms of just mentors who come for a very specific subject or a skill that needs to be taught within a particular course or within a particular module of a course. So there, thereby you start collaborating. The learner starts interacting not only with just uh, a one instructor, but also with uh, industry mentor. And you get personalized address, uh, personalized way of being mentored because they, you start creating breakout sessions that the mentors start getting to get more involved with the learners. Now, as this is going on, there is a learning designer, the course designer who has designed the course, waiting to look into how the interactions that are happening with the learner and also try to see as to how viable this particular course is in terms of imparting the skills, imparting the knowledge, imparting the ability that the learner would like to acquire. So there are key uh, interaction points that happens between the learning designer and learner through a set of series of feedback and surveys in order to understand the applicability of the course for the learner. And more importantly, uh, like what uh, uh, our two previous speakers had uh, uh, spoken about how the entire workplace, the future workplace is changing. You have employers now coming in into the place, into in, right into the education of the learner. So it's not that you need to have the learner go through all the skill collections before he gets ready for the job. Rather, you are actually bringing in or, uh, or bringing, uh, forwarding the uh, skills, like how uh, Leighton has uh, tried it out uh, uh, in Myanmar, where they're trying to get the skills upload, front loaded and then get them ready for employ employment because they're getting the skills included as part of the curriculum. In this case, the employers have uh, collaborated with the learner and are trying to see as to how they can uh, specifically zoom down into those skill sets that they would like the learner to bring to the table as soon as he or she becomes ready for apprenticeship or for future employment. So this is how blended learning is very important. And this is what uh, um, uh, this is what are the advantages of blended learning that comes into place as we go, as we start transforming the pedagogy of delivery in terms of supporting the future of workplace. Having said that, it is not without its challenge. So blended learning is supposed to increase the scalability of delivery of the courses, but there are certain roadblocks. There are certain issues which hamper such a uh, scalability. The first and the foremost is the collaboration. As we know, with any collaboration, you always have uh, 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 a lot of instructions and directives to come into place. So when a learner is going through his learning journey, there is a, quite a bit of facilitation that needs to take place in a blended learning because uh, most of them are self-paced e-learning. So when you come down to a flipped class, a mentor should already be knowing how much of the knowledge or the content has the learner consumed, how much has he really understood, how much has he really reflected that understanding through assessments that he or she must be taking, and how much of that is really uh, something that he's struggling with. So at the same time, a learning designer would also be looking into the same aspect and thinking maybe the, the learner did not consume the content or maybe uh, it was uh, 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 something uh, very difficult for the learner to understand. But the same, on the flip side of it, it may be the fact that the content may not be relevant to the learner, to the skills or the, for the knowledge that he's trying to acquire. So on the other hand, an employer would be working or interacting with the learner to see whether they are on par or on course with the skills that they want this learner to acquire for their particular, uh, for their particular uh, uh, job or the skills that they're trying to train them for. So in this case, what happens is there's a lot of learning facilitation that needs to be done. And for that, you, there's uh, multiple channels of engagement that starts coming to place. And this may uh, uh, impact the learner's uh, focus in terms of what he, what he or she is trying to achieve. So this is one of the biggest learning blocks that a blended learning uh, uh, brings to the fore. Then the fact that there are multiple actors, like we just saw, there is industry mentor who can give certain advice, there is instructor who can give another set of advice, there's an employer who's trying to give you a focus and direction. It all boils down to having too many cooks who, who can potentially spoil the soup, and it may happen if it is not really managed well. So this is the second base, biggest problem of blended learning that comes to place. The third one, uh, which goes down, is to do with the personalization. So the the, the very basis of why blended learning was brought in was to increase the scalability, 
but it also removed the personalization that a physical classroom teaching would have imparted. A teacher would be knowing a student very well or a learner very well, and they would know as to how to manage the uh, manage the curriculum across this particular learner and help them out. Now, in in terms of uh, e-learning, where it's everything is self-paced, uh, there is a need to personalize this in terms of helping out the learner in terms of staying on on track, on focus, in terms of achieving the outcome. To do that, you may need to put in or drive in more time from the mentor or from the instructor, which basically increases the cost. Not only increases the cost, but also limits scalability because your mentors are tied up trying to help them with facilitation work. And lastly, the biggest problem of the blended learning management system as we see now is that there's no complete view of the learning journey. So what do we mean by this? The learner is actually seeing his, 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 his journey. The designer sees only the input that's coming out from the surveys and the feedback. The employer is only seeing in terms of what is required for his users to be matching to the job. The uh, mentors are only coming in very specifically in terms of trying to impart the skills only at a project mentoring stage. So these are all different aspects of touch point that happens, a different part of the learning journey. And there's no single view which comes to place in terms of trying to say, constantly help the, uh, uh, the learner and the educators to be on the same page. So these are the four major problems that comes into blended learning management. And this is something that Leslie was mentioning when he said he's not putting it. It comes from the fact that uh, once you start bringing some of these technologies, it is not just uh, uh, it's not just a technology issue, it's not just the uh, domain issue, but also the fact of transforming the people's mindset. And this is where it comes in place, uh, which created the need for Omnimentor. The Omnimentor uh, uh, is, is an AI-powered system like we discussed earlier, it is data-driven, uh, and we'll see in a little while as to how it really functions, but primarily it drives, it gives you five different benefits or five different uh, solution points. So the first thing is Omnimentor. Um. Hearing, I need to interrupt. I yeah. think you. Hello. Um, Giri? Yeah. Let's see. You are given ten minutes. Okay. Fine. You're way over. Okay. Can you speed it up? Yeah. I'll speed it up. Yeah. Thanks, Leslie. So we have omnichannel engagement where uh, we bring all the actors onto the same page, out to basically the same engagement platform where we open up uh, one to one or one to many chats which comes into place. And these are not just self-directed chat, but also the fact of interviewing chat, where the intervention is being delivered in terms of a learning facilitation. So we have users, learners, who are able to, uh, uh, who, who will be in a different phase of journey. At some point of time, they might be falling behind their assessment, or if they're doing the assessment, they may be failing in their assessment. So all of that facilitation can be delivered through a learning journey facilitation. So which means we intervene actually based on the data and try to help the students to be able to uh, stick to their uh, journey. While doing so, there's assessment that's being done. So these are the assessment points where we are able to uh, uh, look at the, the, the scoring patterns, the, the assessment patterns, the assignment patterns that come to place, the completion pattern, the, con the content consumption patterns, and be able to predictively grade and say how much of your grading would be if you continue in this manner. And if you need to improve your grading or your scoring, what else you can need to do? And how do you go about it? So this kind of information or advice is available not only to the learner, but to the rest of the other uh, mentors or the act, uh, instructors who are actually working with the student. So thereby, you get a complete view of the cohort that's happening at the same time. So to drive this, there's an underlying 360 degree view of the performance dashboard that is getting created. And this 360 degree view gives you the view of the, 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 the learner's analytics, the learning journey analytics, the learning management journey, management analytics too, in terms of trying to say how a cohort, how a learner is performing, how a cohort is performing, how a course content consumption is being utilized, and what else the design aspects of the course that needs to change or potentially be redone, uh, which comes out of uh, some of the dashboard analytics together. So this in nutshell is what only mentor delivers. So how it works, it basically takes all your learning data in terms of demographics, in terms of attendance, engagement, content consumption, assessment survey, and works through, through this magic source of AI's algorithms that we put on top of it. And it starts delivering interpreted data back as intervention chats or back as intervention messages to, uh, the, uh, to the learners, to the faculties, to the instructors, or to the employers who are all working on the same platform at this point of time. And it 
starts off with intervention in terms of trying to help the learner stay on the track of the journey. It then starts going down into prediction in terms of how you're progressing and where you need to be and how you can go to that level and then start adding on in terms of personalization of uh, looking into a specific journey and a specific learner's uh, uh, performance that can be upgraded as you go along and then results into a lot of benchmarking data that, that is spewed out of the system. So this is the functional flow of the information. From a, from a tooling perspective, it is all driven through uh, any standard chat system where you can integrate with something like Telegram or WhatsApp. You have all the learners, you have the inspectors and all on this particular uh, 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 apps on your mobile phone. And as and when these interventions are happening, it gets delivered to you offline or online basis. And this is driven through, you're also allowed to access dashboards, you're also allowed to look at visualizations of the way your MCQs are being addressed, your, your MCQs, the way the difficulty level of the MCQs are being put into place. All of these things are what comes on the dashboards. So underlying that is uh, a various set of scenario playbooks. To keep it simple, playbooks are nothing but a set of rules that uh, works on the data sets patterns, creates certain classifiers and patterns, and then uh, says, uh, gives us the recommendation and the prediction based on how the rules are configured. So this is how we, how the Omnimental works in terms of uh, uh, working with the learners and the rest of the other uh, uh, actors. So a little bit on the technical architecture, which I think I'll just skim through. Uh, we basically pluck out data from the LMS, from the student management systems, from the exam management systems, all of the data gets interpreted, and there is a set of uh, reusability of the data that keeps happening in terms of interactions happening. There is uh, inclusion of uh, uh, certain natural language processing uh, that comes to play. So the user interactions result into refining of the playbooks, and this is something that keeps on uh, ongoing as we go along in terms of the usage of the system. So to sum it up, uh, basically the value propositions uh, are uh, uh, three phase. One is for the learners where we help them to uh, have a personalized learning journey, bring back the concept of classroom, where the teacher knows the student very well. This is what, what we deliver to Omni Mentor for the learners. Get uh, timely intervention so that you stay on track and, and, and uh, uh, get the remedial action to place so that you know you can get the learning out of that you're coming for. For educators, it uh, allows you to look at the entire classroom uh, in a cohort-like, in a very intelligent manner because it gives you all the data points and it nudges you to do certain things in terms of trying to manage and help the students. It also tries to make you make the educators very uh, productive and efficient, uh, simply because they can now scale up the ability to manage multiple cohorts at the same time, because they visualize feedback they're getting for each learner and for the cohort together. And it also allows you to redesign courses based on the learning insights that you're obtaining uh, from the entire uh, 360 degree uh, analytics that is being embedded into the system. From an employer perspective, uh, uh, it is very key that uh, they are able to customize the learning journey to their needs, to their job skills, uh, to their uh, business that they need these learners to come into. By being able to rejig the courses and having rejigged the courses, they're able to track these courses based on their needs. And the last thing is to basically allow them to be actively involved in shaping the learning outcome to meet their business needs. So with this, uh, I'd like to conclude my uh, short uh, discussion on Omni Mentor, and if there are any other questions, I think I'll be available to take it up at a later point of time. Thank you, Thierry. I think it's a very comprehensive as well in, the, in terms of our presentations to have this 360 mentorship program, the, the tools that's able to customize and personalize the learning journey as well as the learning outcome of the learner. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. We are now going into our academicians route. So our academicians will be discussing on education policy, the emerging trend, transformation landscape, and also their plan from the current pandemic situation towards a future ready university. Our first academic speaker is Professor Anil. Without much introduction, I believe almost everybody in the technology industries in India would know who is Professor Anil. He's the chairman of All India Council for Technical Education. Professor Anil is the chairman, again, of All India Council for Technical Education, AICTE in short. So AICTE is the accreditation authority for all technical and management education systems in India, from graduate to postgraduate programs under specific categories that Indian institutions as per its charter. Professor Anil has 31 years of illustrious career and held several top academic research and administrative positions along across India. He is also the chairman and expert member on various national level committees, 
such as the Basic Scientific yeah. Research and mm -hmm. Powered Committee of University Grants Commission, Sua Yang Board, and also the Chairman for the Board of Governors of the Institute, National Institute of Technology in Ishanaga. Professor Arnold was awarded with Maha Entrepreneur Award 2011 of Praj Industries Pune, and his leadership and innovative abilities in the area of technology development and entrepreneurship initiatives. Professor Arnold graduated in mechanical engineering from first rank and gold medal in 1980. He also obtained a master's in 1982 and doctoral degree with University Grants Commission Fellowship in 1989 from the Indian Institute of Science and in Bangalore. Professor Anil, it is our honor to have you with us today. The audience is right for you now. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, probably already evening in Singapore. Uh, welcome to all of you to this particular session where academicians are going to talk. I was listening to Leslie, and in fact, we had a similar meeting a couple of days back uh, in another forum. Yeah, I listened to Giridhar Nayak and, and uh, of course, I uh, thank Rahul for uh, inviting me over this for this platform. And my good friend Bharat is also going to speak. He's from India, from Pune, one of the institutions uh, where I, I had uh, looked at how they progress from one level to the other level. Uh, now, being a regulator in technical education and what are we going to do during COVID and post-COVID times is very, very important. And what is given here is a, a, a poster where it talks about future-ready university in 90 days. So I think we are talking about uh, a future university which would be fully ready at 90 days' time. Uh, it's very difficult to make a new university for it about 90 days. Sometimes it takes years to make it because I was associated with the setting up of uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Guwahati, in Assam. And, uh, in the formative years to get established, it took about five years in the brick and mortar, mortar model. Then subsequently to really scale up the high, you know, spirits and also get into going into better quality of education. It took another 10 years. So I think brick and mortar universities always took about minimum 10 to 15 years to stabilize. And to really come to excellence, it normally takes about 25 years. And therefore, this 90 days business is very, very difficult one. But however, with the adaptability and the use of technology that is available at our disposal, this job may not be so difficult as what we normally assume. And the reason being some of us are already prepared in some way in terms of online education, using MOOCs platform for uh, giving the lectures for the students. We have also had uh, several types of other online activities which have been happening during the COVID times and the faculty development programs, whether it is students being engaged in terms of internships, whether students are being interviewed for their selections as well as for their appointments. I think online has, in a way, come to stay. And therefore, uh, the only thing which is needed, as Leslie rightly pointed out, that technology is available, whether our mindsets are ready for accepting the change. Uh, that's why adaptability becomes very, very significant and important in today's time. And so in the future, in the 90 days, what needs to be done is where technology has not reached, we have to ensure that it reaches. For example, in a large country of our size in India with 1.35 billion population, with huge number of states, different languages, I think penetration of the internet to nooks and corners. See, one of the ideas earlier was road to every village. And then subsequently, we talked about electricity to all villages. Today, the new slogan should be internet connectivity to every village and every home. So if we are able to achieve that, probably online will become normally very, very easily achievable. And then second point, which uh, uh, Nayak also pointed out, is very important, as well as Leslie pointed out in some way, uh, is about the physical interaction and actual classes being held on the campus. It has its own value. Uh, when we come to the theoretical knowledge, it's very easy to adopt it and then send it across via online mechanism and medium, whether it is MOOCs courses or uh, various LMS systems which have come in place. But when you want to really uh, get some kind of values to be embedded in the students, I, I think you require face-to-face -face mode of uh, brick-and-mortar education. 
Uh, it is not merely the um, morals and values and ethics, but also many other facets. You know, a student has to live a life where he is interacting with real human beings, not the robots. And therefore, when he is in a classroom, he will interact with students physically, as well as sometimes there are some arguments, discussions, debates. He will be associated with various clubs, whether it is robotics club or automotive club. He will work. He will work with hands actually, hands-on experience. There are laboratory classes, workshop practices, which are required to be learned on the machines. They cannot be only on the virtual mode, and therefore there is a necessity of students coming to the campuses. So often we are talking about the new normal, which is going to be a blended one. Some part will be in the online mode and some part will be offline mode. And I was very excited to see the technology being utilized for creating a portal where seamless uh, online and offline is likely to happen. And I think there are many possible other ways also. And what we talk about uh, use of technology, especially AI, Artificial intelligence and machine learning has that capability of uh, almost monitoring the progress of the student exactly like what would have happened in terms of a real teacher and student relationship. Uh, in India, we call Guru Shishya Parampara. So we have students coming to the gurus, that is the teachers, and then they have a strong bonding interaction. And every small flaw that a student has is corrected by the teacher. Uh, I think this was possible because with a small number of students, one faculty is associated. Quite often in our universities, we all talk about student-faculty ratio, which is normally said to be good if it is about 1 is to 10 or at most 1 is to 12 and not more than that. Uh, thereby, there is a constant engagement between teachers and students. They will be able to moderate, correct, and also mentor and take students forward in the journey of learning. And therefore, can we do it in, in the online mode? And this question can be answered through the, as I said, AI and machine learning, where if the kind of responses that the student is giving, the number of hours he is actually putting in in learning the, the courses that are being admitted to him and asked to watch the videos, based on all of that and the type of questions he asks, if there is a blog, can he answer some of the questions raised by some of his peers? I think by looking at all of that and getting engaged with a strong AI tool, one can really determine where a student is lagging and what further needs to be given to him so that he will perfect his art and science of uh, the new technology that is emerging. I think there are several tools which have already emerged, and I'm very happy to say that in India, there are a large number of startups as well as some of the larger companies who have come up with AI-based personalized learning tools which are absolutely adaptable. A student will get into this particular module, he will be tested for his current state of knowledge and what he wants to achieve, that is basically outcomes that he wants to achieve, and gradually the portal will take him through a journey of learning certain courses, subjects, and even it may be at micro level to some of them macro level and gradually leading the journey towards perfection and excellence in that particular domain where he is interested. Uh, I think these types of tools being already available, we have enlisted them on our portal. Many of them during the lock, lockdown period in, in the COVID-19 times have come forward for giving all of them free of cost, and there are about 50 such applications on board. They are from all kinds of subjects, right, from AI itself to IoT, machine learning, 3D printing, blockchain, cyber security, cloud computing, you name it, and there is a course which is available for learning through all of these platforms. I'm sure most of us are also aware of uh, edX platform of MIT, as well as uh, that of Coursera uh, from Stanford and so on. So I think throughout the world, there have been several possibilities that exist. But what was very interesting was, over a period of last a decade or so, we were gradually getting moving into the online mode of, uh, or mixed mode or what we call hybrid mode or blended mode of learning, but the progress was very slow. It was almost like an incubator in a startup system. So we were incubating these kind of ideas and technologies in our educational institutions. The COVID-19 has forced us to create a super accelerator 
not just accelerator. In start of terminology, we talk about accelerator, but here it is super accelerator. And the pace at which the changes are already happening and likely to happen will bring in a new normal where a university possibly can be established in 90 days, fully functional, and many of the, at least, uh, if not full degrees, but at least some part of the degree can be certainly offered through such kind of mechanisms and, and possible technologies. Now, coming back, uh, very interestingly, AICT through a committee had also come up with what are the new and emerging technologies. In the industry always talks about students being uh, lopsided in terms of learning very old skill sets which are not useful for the industry 4.0. And so through the committee, we identified all those nine courses which are very significant and important. So instead of starting a full-fledged graduate program in AI, IoT, machine learning, deep learning, robotics, 3D printing, blockchain, cybersecurity, and uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, we said these courses should be at least uh, uh, offered in terms of what is known as minor degree. So a student may do a mechanical major but along with that, 18 to 20 credits, if he does in AI, he will get a minor degree in AI. Suppose a computer science student does uh, 3D printing, uh, you know, some 18 credits, he will get a computer science major with a minor in 3D printing. I think that is the way forward that we have already implemented, which will improve employability of our graduates to a great extent on one side, and many of them can come forward and create their own startups. Because these are all areas where a lot of applications are required in the future, and our students who are so bright can come up with solutions. And we are pretty confident for two reasons that India experimented with what is known as Smart India Hackathon, where uh, problem statements from government departments, industries were thrown as challenge for our students. Undergrad students of just second year, third year of engineering came out with brilliant out-of-the-box solutions. We were then shortlisted, and some of these solutions after the hackathon and prize-winning teams made to work for another six months as a project have been implemented by the government, implemented by the, you know, many companies. So that shows the strength that exists amongst our students, only that we need to give it a finding, find finishing touches, give them encouragement, give them support, and give them mentorship. I, I think that is the role that uh, we all have. And I'm very happy that uh, our Honorable Prime Minister Modi, when he had been to Singapore, he raised this issue with the Prime Minister of Singapore. And there was the first ever uh, India-Singapore hackathon held in Nanyang Technological University just about two years ago. Followed up with that, we had a counterpart hackathon, which was held in IIT Madras. Students from Singapore, both NUS, NTU, and other institutions came here. And uh, there was a very interesting uh, challenging statement which was given to them and they found out solutions which are useful for not only government but many of the industries. I think the way forward is give practical exposure, give practical internships to students along with the theory part of it and I'm sure that they will all be very successful, uh, capable and uh, engineers who are going to be useful for the entire society. I conclude here if there are any questions later I will take them on. But otherwise, I think these times are going to be very exciting times post-COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you very much for this very trying moment that we are all going through right now for sharing at least the silver lining that is available, especially in the education industry and being a very big evangelist and supporters that using the power of unified and advanced technology to en enable a fully blended learning pedagogy without sacrificing human interaction, whether offline or online. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, now let's invite our next international speaker, Professor Claire Ozan. Professor Claire Ozan is the Vice Pro Provost at the University of Roehampton, London, where she is responsible to lead the university international strategy, collaborative partnerships, as well as online program development and delivery. Prior to this, Claire was the Assistant Dean for Learning and Teaching, as well as the Head of Biological and Health Sciences Department. Professor Ozan is also a founding member of the Global Canopy Program that has significantly benefited many countries, for example, Australia, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Uganda. She is also a grant reviewer for international bodies, including Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the Norwegian Research Council, and the UNESCO. 
Claire attained her doctor in philosophy from the Oxford University in year 1991 and is a professor of ecology, highly recognized for her seminal contribution to forest canopy science. Professor Ozan is also a principal fellow of the Higher Academy, Higher Education Academy. Professor Ozan, good morning and welcome and the stage is yours. Good morning and good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, from the UK to all participants in, in this event. Uh, the University of Roehampton is located in southwest London in the UK, about 45 minutes from the Houses of Parliament. And I'm very pleased to be able to share our uh, journey of transformation uh, with you today. We're a university with just over 9,000 students on campus and about the same number of students online and with our partners around the world. Our purpose to change lives and improve the world is pursued with an underpinning ethos of supporting and encouraging and challenging our staff and our students. So in this presentation, I'm going to uh, cover five future readiness topics. I'm going to consider the UK government strategy for digital skills. Say something about why the University of Roehampton in many ways was ready for remote learning. To look at the university's principles and approaches to remote learning and to share with you some of our first steps to mitigate COVID-19 and our future plan for next year, the autumn term. So firstly, something about government strategy. So in 2017, uh, the UK government published two key strategies. The UK industrial strategy, building a better Britain for the future, which contained five grand challenges, one of which was AI and the data economy and they pledged to support digital training and education and skills. And then the UK digital strategy focused on uh, ensuring that uh, we were upskilled to meet the needs of future jobs. And within the UK digital strategy was a section on the digital capability for all. Firstly, this addressed embedding skills in education, both formally up to the age of 16 and then through the development of new qualifications, T-levels or technical levels, A-levels, equivalent to A-levels at 18, and also uh, enabling students to pick up uh, digital skills through volunteering that they might do. Then they address lifelong learning through apprenticeships, very similar to uh, the approach that uh, Mr. Leslie Lowe described earlier on of work-based learning. Developed a national college for digital skills and also ensuring that access to the internet and technology could be free for all by providing it through our local library networks. There's also a strand on women and digital skills and on cyber security. And then an approach in tandem with business, working with business to provide coding and digital skills training with organisations like Cisco, British Telecom, Barclays and, and others. So now to say something uh, about Roehampton's approach. Roehampton has a history of inclusivity and innovation, which I think are really important stepping stones to remote learning, placing us in a really good position to meet the current challenges. Our constituent colleges were founded in the mid 19th century to provide pioneering higher education to women. We were one of the first institutions in the UK to adopt flexible degree structures in the 1990s, to offer fully online programmes with, with private providers, and to address the needs of students who commute on a daily basis to our campus, and to provide flexible and blended learning for those students. We were amongst the first UK institutions to move to remote learning 
to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Although our campus has always been open, we still have about 500 students living on our campus. And underpinning this, I think it's important that we uh, also state how important when we move forward in this new era, our attention to physical health and mental health issues uh, will be. And we have a, a strap line, safe study, safe campus going into the next academic year. The number of principles on which we've based our remote learning. Firstly, that all the material we provide must be inclusive. That means recognisable to all, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic background, and accessible to all, so including all of those who are, who are disabled in some way. Our teaching sessions should have a flexible design and really engage students so that they are active rather than passive learners. Our modules have a structured, coherent approach and a consistency across programmes so that students understand where their journey is taking them. And we build in student support in a, a, a regular uh, points throughout the programme. Moving then to the first steps that Roehampton took uh, when we were faced with, not, with lockdown as a result of the impact of COVID. We moved uh, our lectures online so that students could study them at any point at any time, but retained our live classes, which were synchronous and broadcast to stu students. We ensured that there was comprehensive access to books and other learning materials a library anywhere approach. We moved our support for students online, including access to assessment support and other kinds of student support, such as mental health uh, and disability support. Our careers and work experience teams also moved online. And we reached out to all our students, starting with the first years and then working through the student cohort by phone, and by email to make sure that they were coping with these extraordinary times, able still to engage with their learning and uh, in a, a good position to capitalise on that. We developed a Roehampton, a University of Roehampton community of practice support our staff to ensure that staff were ready to deal with the challenges of moving to remote learning. Working first with some of our champions who had strong digital skills and were always already working with blended learning, we rolled out our experiences and shared experiences amongst the staff community, both those things that went well and those things that didn't go well. We can learn a lot from those. We provide IT training, technology training for our staff, and also engage them in pedagogical development to ensure that we are. Um, really at the forefront uh, of what we can offer to our students. And you can see here our, our Moodle community of learning practice, which is very well used and very well uh, recognised by our staff. Underpinning our move to remote learning and how we will work in the coming academic year is a clear learning design, starting with an investigation phase where we uh, introduce topics to the student where they're able to access content in text and video and, and uh, online mode. We then move into the explore phase where students can carry out their core reading, extended reading, explore case studies and other materials that we're offered to them. And then finally moving into the discuss and apply stage where students are engaged actively in online discussions and are able to apply their knowledge, ask questions. And this is a key phase where tutors are engaged, although they support the students right through that learning journey. We've also had a focus on assessment because we've had to change the way we assess without uh, examinations on, on campus and ensure that all our assessment is accessible to students. We work on the principle that students must be able to do all assessment remotely and it mustn't depend, be dependent on particular technological abilities or resources. Our new assessments, where they are new, still need to fit with the learning outcomes of the module, 
and uh, 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 ensure that they remain fit for purpose. And we've retained our module assessment plans because we feel that in this environment, formative assessment is even more important uh, as, as we go forward to ensure students are engaged and are able to check where they are with tutors in their learning journey. Going then into the future, how will we look as a university in the autumn when we welcome our students? We expect we are planning to welcome them to the campus. The campus is open, it will remain open, but in a different way. Our lectures will be online, asynchronous, so students can access them whenever they wish to do so, whenever it's convenient and how they want to do that. We are planning face-to-face -face small group teaching when and where possible and synchronous online. And that will be online if we are not able to do that face-to-face. -face. The campus is open. It will be open with physical distancing protocols in place, masks, safe routes to travel around the campus, safe accommodation, library and safe social activities. And we must be prepared for future lockdown events in the autumn and winter, should they be in place. I'd like to finish by thanking a number of my colleagues at Roehampton who have really driven this work forward. Joe Pete, Stephen Driver, Kate Dobson, Sinitha Andran, and many of our academic colleagues who have explored, developed, and contributed to our learning journey at Roehampton. And I'd be very happy to take any questions when it comes to the Q&A session. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you so much for sharing with us what a caring, innovative, and forward-looking university like yours, and how you have used technology to achieve agility as well as for your campus, as well for your current and future goals. Now, our third academic speaker is Dr. Lady Chan. So Dr. Chan is the Chief Executive and Vice Chancellor of Wawasan Open University in Penang, Malaysia. Dr. Chan was previously the Chief Executive of the NUS Enterprise at the National University of Singapore for 13 years. She transformed the university's enterprise division into one of the most admired and most respected higher education entrepreneurial ecosystems in Singapore that has nurtured hundreds of startups and thousands of students' internship placement locally and abroad. And it has been cited by the Straits Times of Singapore that her initiative is probably the single most important development to boost the startup movement in Singapore. Dr. Chan also held multiple top leadership positions in the public and commercial sectors, such as managing director of the investment arm of Bio One Capital Private Limited. She was also the general manager and director of product development for Gene Lab Diagnostics Private Limited. Dr. Chan, may I now invite you to share your presentation with us? Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Hope uh, everybody is still awake, I think. Um, all right, let me talk a little bit about where I'm at. And I went from developing a startup community in Singapore and be part of the startup community in Singapore to now uh, managing an institution in Penang. And what did I see in this? And um, what is it? What is this university? And why is it so special? As you can see, um, it's a beautiful campus. It's a small university. Um, let me get to the next slide. Okay. The, it's a private university. The first group of students came in January 2007. So obviously, it's a very new university. The students, this is open distance learning, a bit of online, um, and I hope people understand the difference between distance and online because um, it, it also took me a while to sort of get our faculty up to it. And the camp, and we also have full time on campus learning, a small percentage of the students using very similar curriculum and syllabus that we use for the distance learning. Um, curriculum. Um, the university was set up to provide a gateway to higher education for those who would otherwise be denied access to good education 
or were not able to do it. So they, they could be, um, they are all working adults mostly. Close to over 24,000 students have actually experienced this learning environment. The school has, the university has four faculties, a school of business administration, a school of education, humanities, and social sciences, school of science and technology, and we recently formed a new school of digital technology. And um, you will find that as I go on that this is very, very, um, it sort of overlaps with what Leslie is saying, and, and there's a reason why. How do we how do we deliver, and what is the mode of learning and delivery for our university? Materials and cost content are on our learning management system, like all open universities and distance learning open universities. There is study guides. Um, there is cost material, um, and our cost material now is slowly being revamped and re and and being changed into a more interactive format. We call it our W flex format, but it's actually in the form of flipbooks. The study guides in the flipbooks, you can insert um, videos, URLs. You can make it very, very interactive, and, and that's what we've been doing at the university. Um, because it is remote distance learning, a lot of students would like to have additional support. And therefore, there are tutorials every three to four weeks for the course that they are taking, and the tutorials are optional. For the most part, we've been running the tutorials face-to-face, -face, and obviously with COVID, we had to go online with it. And that, that essentially wasn't an issue for us. There are other issues which I'll talk about. Assessments is a combination of assignments, quizzes, final exams, um, and essentially, it's all based on self-paced learning. I wanted to, to, to touch a little bit on the Malaysian um, um, education system. There are essentially 50% of Malaysian students are in the public universities, and another 50% are in private universities. And as you can see, there are a large number of private universities. If you look at um, the colleges, and if you look at the universities, there are as many as, if you combine this, there are as many as 100 um, private universities in Malaysia. So the question then is, are there enough students for the private universities? Obviously there is, and in Malaysia, um, there is the education part of Malaysia. Education is essentially an industry in Malaysia. As you can see here, about 100,000 of the um, 1.3 million students um, are international students. And obviously, this COVID period has affected many of them. At WOU, Wawasan, we don't have international students. Um, our students, if they're international, they would have to be domiciled in Malaysia, they're either working or they are partners uh, or spouses of Malaysian citizens. So, so our numbers are really small. The, as I indicated, the education is an industry and there is a large emphasis on TVET and quality TVET graduates. And that, I think, is, as everybody can recognize, um, a future to equip students with the skills, and as what Leslie earlier has discussed this, this is essentially what is quite an important pathway for students. Um, just this year, the private industry um, universities have come out with a, a blueprint, Education as an Industry 2020 to 2025, and this was put together by many, many colleagues in the private industry. And in it, it described how Malaysia can be a front leader in this part of the world um, with education as industry. And obviously, with the recent COVID situation, um, everyone's struggling, um, but I'm pretty sure once this is over, we have all learned and we've all gained from this experience. So how has COVID impacted our university. We're fortunate we are remote learning. 
Um, it wasn't an issue. We knew our students would be fine. We immediately had to turn all our tutorials to online synchronous. In certain cases, asynchronous. We still use the same schedules. Um, so in a sense, it did not affect us that much, if you think about it, operationally. However, we didn't realize that we had to deal with students and staff who did not have access to broadband internet at home. And in many, many places, intermittent connections in many, many locations. So how did these students and staff cope prior to COVID? Many of them use the broadband at work. They would be in coffee shops where broadbands are offered free, or they would come onto campus, small as it may be, and they spend time in the library and they access it. We had to move a lot of desktop computers back home for our staff during that period prior to it. And we started to realize that um, the infrastructure of a university, of an institution, to cope with this is very, very important. And in essence, we need to be able to figure out ways to level the playing field for both students and staff in the university. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that um, because many of us are talking about it, but we don't realize it until you know you, you are faced with it, um, the situation, and, and how do we how how do we cope with it? With our staff, we had a lot of it. We had to buy cards, we had to buy dongles to provide our staff so that they it takes the stress out of them. Um, they can then cope with the students, they can get online with students, and they can get online with other colleagues at work. An important part of post-COVID for our university is really to look at the infrastructure in, on campus, as well as the infrastructure in the community. The infrastructure, the hardware, the network, the data, the virtual remote access, you spend money, you can get it done. But the community and the locality where you are located will also you need to work in tandem. We need to convince um, service providers that they need to penetrate into certain areas where our staff and students live. So that's that's a different that's a different challenge uh, we are facing. Within the university infrastructure, the information structure needs to be there, and all universities will have it in various forms. And for us, is how do we integrate this post-COVID? We have it, we're a 13 year old university. Essentially, we should be quite, it should be quite um, seamless to integrate all that, but you don't know until you are faced with the situation. And the third part, one can spend money to buy the infrastructure and set the infrastructure, one can you know, spend money to put in the best learning management systems. The third part is really the people. If the staff, students are not really with it, that whatever you put in will not work that well. So we found that changing mindsets um, is quite important. We had certain staff who do not have smartphones and hold certain positions in the university where being offline, um, we needed them to be online. So the good thing out of all this is in the last three months, two and a half months or three months, I think our faculty, our staff, our students are now getting very familiar and they're comfortable with it. I also need to remind our audience that as I indicated earlier, our students are not from the very well-to-do. So we are servicing a, a group of, um, a population of uh, students that are, they, they could have gone to private universities, to put it this way, if they can afford it. But because they needed to work, therefore they came to a university like ours. The university moving forward, it's become very clear, and part of my um, um, reason for taking up this position is to relook at how education can be changed and can be transformed. 
And we realized that 83% of our students are below the age of 40. Majority profiles within 25 to 39 years old. And they are worried about how can they secure a job after graduating? And many of them are very familiar with this before. Um, so we need to provide um, course materials. We need to provide a lot of um, curriculum that goes with this generation. We need to turn it into skill-centric education. We need to make sure there's a lot more on-the-job workplace training, training and internship. Mind you, our students are already working for many of them. So we need to be able to communicate with their um, employers and see how, as a university, we can work closer with them. The education and occupation, we need to make sure that they can earn and learn so that they can pay their tuition fees. And um, we need to make sure they can be work ready before graduating, guarantee, and, and find some way to see if they can guarantee jobs and career placement. And you heard this comment from Leslie, right? So we started a new school of digital technology early this year. Um, we are going to introduce a new degree in software engineering and evolve a more contemporary program. We will also introduce a new degree in digital business with core components brought in from current courses plus courses that we will develop with our partner. The, this is essentially the model that Leslie had earlier articulated. So, so it's obvious that we are working closely um, developing these two programs for accreditation in Malaysia. So the first year is a study boot camp. Um, Leslie has gone into it. Um, it's full-time employment in year two to three or internship appointment in year two to three. And hopefully by year four, the students can come out. I, I don't need to go into details because I think Leslie did my talk for me for this part. Um, blended model consisting of full-time part-time studies, as I've said, Bootcamp can be integrated into our structure to create the relevant program for first-year students for full-time study. Um, we are fortunate because we have the infrastructure and the structure already put in place. Um, it's all now down to taking it through the, um, um, the accreditation agency to get it um, provisionally approved so that we can launch it in September or in January, depending on the time frame. With our partner, this is the slide taken off from Vision. Um, obviously, we have been working very closely together the last several months. I think um, we're not able to launch a new program in 90 days as what Leslie would like to have. But, you know, it is something that is ongoing and we're quite excited about launching a program like that. The in Penang, as you can see, post-COVID, um, we talk a lot about getting the next phase of remote learning right in higher education, but it should not just be content. It needs to be within, it needs to go into the workplace. So how do we integrate that? Um, there is also talk on the rise of online learning raises questions about price we put on education. Online doesn't mean it is cheaper, and many of you know that. Um, and at the end, you need to be able to provide the assurance, the content, and everything inside your structure and your curriculum that will enable students to want to come to your university. And I took this, and this is my last slide, to build the workforce of the future. This is from the World Economic Forum. We really need to revolutionize how we educate how we learn, and um, how we transform certain universities. I'm not going to say all universities, because my previous employer was NUS. They are also transforming right now. But in a small university like WOU, I think the opportunities are there. And I think um, we're very excited. We want to transform it, and we'll make it very, very different in this part of the world. Thank you. I think I'm on time. Yes, very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Chan, and thank you for being such a candidate in sharing about your university's transformation and leading the way in Malaysia. Thank you very much. So our fourth academic speaker today is Ms. Sandy Damowit Noto. Uh, Sandy is the Vice Rector from the President's University of Indonesia. She is a very passionate executive with special interest in quality assurance, online learning, and using technology to accelerate business innovation. As the Vice Rector of the University, Sandy is also a lecturer in the Faculty of Computing, where she teaches web development, programming concepts, and computer networks. Prior to this, she was a Director of Quality Assurance of the President University with extensive software development and system analysis experiences. Sandy graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the Coventry University and a Master of Information Technology from James Cook University. Sandy, may I invite you to present to the audience? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Joel. You're welcome. Um, everyone, for everyone, thank you for your enthusiasm in today's webinar. I see a lot of attendees from Indonesia. Selamat sore. Yeah. Uh, today, I would like to share about what we've done at President University in the hope to future-proof our graduates and what we plan to do in the near future. A little bit about uh, President University. We are a private higher education institution in Indonesia. We became a full-fledged university in 2004. And at the moment, we have about 4,738 students, and uh, out of which 10% of the students are international students. Our international students came from 18 different countries with China, Timor-Leste, and Vietnam being the, um, the highest numbers. We are located in the heart of Jabba Beka Industrial Estate in West Java, and we are offering 16 bachelor degree program and two master's degree program. Now, um, like I said, I wanted to share about what we do to future-proof our graduates. We are a very industry-focused uh, institution, which means that we build a very good relationship with the industry so that we can get uh, feedback from them about our curricula and about how uh, what kind of skills that the students need. And to solidify it, we, are, uh, we have a compulsory internship program for all of our students. And this internship program um, is one semester long. Yep. At the moment, in uh, 2019, we have 810 companies. I'm not sure about 2020, because the last data that I had is 2019, and the numbers keep, keeps growing from year to year. And these are the number of companies that take our students as interns. Okay. Um, most of our students are doing their internship in manufacturing. That's about 30% uh, of them. Yeah. Uh, PT Mattel, Mattel is the Barbie and uh, I forgot what it's called. It's a car or something, yeah. It's a, there's a car toy. And, um, they hire a lot of our students, followed by Jababeka, Pertamina. These are the major industries that hire our students as interns. So we've been doing pretty good, but we felt that we need to add more to our provision. So in 2016, uh, we encouraged the faculty members to start using blended learning. We are using uh, Schoology for LMS, but now we shifted to Moodle with Big Blue Button, Google Meet, Zoom, and um, to record lessons, we use iSpring and Camtasia. And the goal is to get the lecturers to apply flipped learning, which means that the students read and review the multimedia materials before they're coming to class. Uh, and we optimize the use of our class time by um, for problem solving and for projects. Yeah. Now, the big shift in the policy in Indonesia happens um, with the arrival of our new uh, education minister, which is Mr. Nadi Makarim. Mr. Nadi Makarim is the 
is an entrepreneur and he is someone who believes in the importance of creativity and innovation. And he launched a new idea, it's called the Campus Perdeka, or called the Independent Campus, where now our students are free to choose his or her learning path for up to 40 credit units or two semesters, which means that they can extend their internship to two semesters long, or they can choose to study abroad, or they can choose to do uh, to study in a different study program. Uh, obviously, we are happy about this and we quickly seize this opportunity to redesign our curricula and to up allow more learning pathways for the students. And we believe uh, that this is a good move. Uh, this allows our students to personalize their learning journey. And then the inevitable happened, which is COVID-19. And it has forced all higher education institutions to go online. Yep. All schools and all universities are have to close down immediately and everybody now have to work at home and study at home. Yeah. Um, in a sense that we are quite ready. However, uh, turns out there are some issues. Yeah. There's still some issues. Yeah, going full online in a hurry has caused uh, dissatisfactions, both in the students part and also in the lecturers part and even in the staff. Yeah because of the mismatched expectations and a lot of lecturers do not prepare their learning materials optimized for online learning. And there are also issues such as unstable internet connection in remote areas. In Indonesia is huge. When we told our students to go back to their hometown, you will never know whether their hometown has, uh, has a good stable internet connection or not. And the lack of face-to-face -face meetings have changed the whole dynamic. For example, in my class, I have four classes and I plan to give them all quizzes. And I realized that out of the four classes, one of the class, none of the students submitted the quiz at all. Yep. And nobody told me anything. And several days after, I, I still did not hear anything. And uh, surprisingly, I didn't check as well until when I look at the score result and I wondered why everybody got zero and nobody ever did it. Turns out the problem was with me because I didn't set the quiz as feasible. You see, uh, the problem is that in, in a traditional brick and mortar classroom, this will not happen, but this can happen in online class. And so I was pretty shocked that the, none of the students asked and uh, emailed me or WhatsApp me and saying why they cannot access the quiz. They just let it go. You know, so these are <laughs> some of the problems that can happen online in, in when we go full online. And this dissatisfaction in many institutions eventually leads to student protests. For example, and if you see in the screen here, is the U Chicago for fair tuition. They demand a 50% tuition cut due to financial hardships. And also they cited that the fact that for them, online class is just not the same as the brick and mortar traditional classroom. So they're very unhappy about it. And, um, from this, we learned that, in fact, designing a good online course is not as easy as moving everything from offline to online. There's a lack of interpersonal communication. You know? Lectures become a bit boring. Yeah? Um, it's a bit difficult for us to accurately assess the student's performance now. And there are some practical and lab works that are simply hard to do in online setting. Um, in traditional classroom setting, everyone can see each other. Question and answer can happen anytime. But now, everyone is asked to mute their um, speakers, just like now, right? Which is a bit eerie, which means that you're talking to yourself. Uh, you see, it's like, uh, it feels very different. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that it's all gloom and doom about online learning, because as what we know, uh, students do learn online. Students do learn online is just not from their professors. Yeah, they learn it from somewhere else. Yeah. And um, where do they go? They go to YouTube. Yeah. Students and lecturers love their YouTube tutors. Yeah. Um, here is uh, Derek Penas. Derek Penas is a very prominent YouTube tutor for programming. He has 1.5 million subscribers. And if you're in the art field, you would know about uh, Ross Draw's channel, uh, which is, uh, this is Ross Tran. He's the tutor. And he also has millions of subscribers. Um, fans follow him closely. 
And if you can see people are writing comments and uh, people who are writing comments and actively contributing to this channel are also actually university students. So they are learning. Yeah. So because of this, it's, I think it's time for us to rethink about how we design our online classes. Um, um, the problem is this, from what I see is that um, professors are not YouTube tutors. Yeah? Uh, their livelihood do not depend on how many subscribers they get uh, or how many thumbs up they get in a single video. No, uh, it's very different from this YouTuber where they they are uh, challenged every day to increase the number of subscribers and they want as much as possible, as many as possible. Um, so also professors have their plates full with other tasks such as research and publications and so on. So it's not very fair, it's unfair to expect professors to replicate the skill sets of YouTubers. But we can learn from each other. So in President University, I, uh, we, we are in the process of redesigning our online provisions, and we plan to do it in 90 days. Yep. What we're going to use as a checklist on whether our uh, online provision will be sufficient or whether it will be holistic and effective or not for our students is by using the community of inquiry model as a reference. Yep. So we build checklists based on this. For example, whether or not the learning environment facilitates student learning facilities. And uh, we also want these lecturers to provide students with timely and supportive feedback. And students are to be given a clear instruction for all the course activities so there's no confusion. And we will also train our lecturers to inject their personalities in their online class. So it has to be um, their personality should shine uh, so that the students feel like they're interacting with real human and not just um, PowerPoint slides and text. Yeah. Uh, they should feel that they are, there are real lecturers behind this, this screen that they can ask questions to, that they can talk to, just like in the offline setting. And lecturers should encourage students to share their thoughts, beliefs, and ideas in the class. And whether or not the online classes provide uh, chances for small group discussions and collaborations between students. And we will also look at the cognitive presence. Yeah? Um, we should look at the course and think of the bigger picture. What skills do you want your students to take away from this? And assessment should be created based on that. And so we are leaving, we're moving away from road learning and memorization, and we have to uh, change that mindset. And um, it has to be suitable for online environment as well. Yeah. We will encourage uh, creativity and innovation, even in online setting. And we encourage students to share and contribute what they have learned in their social media and personal homepage. In fact, both students and lecturers should build a solid net presence. So how are we going to do this in 90 days? What uh, we're doing now is that we're looking for talents. We're looking for talents in uh, lecturers and senior students who love online learning, who are passionate about it, and we train them so that they can help the, uh, they can help the lecturers as course designer. So this course designer team will be placed in a small team with the other lecturers as the subject matter expert. So they will be the one that helped the professors to create and design a good course that is uh, engaging and effective. We plan to train and retrain all the lecturers in 10 days time to get everyone on the same page, even if they've already did an online, uh, online learning training before. And next we'll build small teams consisting of the professor and also a course designer put in the team as well. Yep. And this small team will work together to build an online course. The goal is that in 90 days, they can build either one, at, at least one or two class, two online courses. They will build their online course in the small team and then they'll be evaluated by uh, getting, getting feedback from senior students and experts 
to recheck on the quality of the online materials. And if it's okay, then they can uh, get it approved and they can go live. If it's not, then um, we will reiterate the process again until uh, everybody in the evaluation team uh, gives it an approval. Uh, so that is our 90 days plan of um, designing. Now for, for uh, higher education institutions who are pressed with time, I think the best solution is um, if you really need to get this done quickly is by engaging with a third party partner, the one that uh, is, um, that has expertise in building online uh, courses, or also you can uh, check your major textbooks publishers. They often offer multimedia um, videos and um, animations that will be able to complement their books. You can use the materials that they provide to uh, quickly build your online classes. And we don't know how long this COVID will last in Indonesia. So far, the number is creeping up and up and up. So I think this is something that we really need to think about. And we really need to get this done very quickly in Indonesia. Uh, because we don't know whether this is going to be over soon. And hopefully it will be. Um, even if it's over, and we really need to rethink about the number of students in the class now. If it, too big and too tight, then it's not good enough, then maybe we can split some to online setting and some to offline setting. Yeah. I think um, that's all from us. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, thank you, Lisan, for organizing this as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you very much. With respect to Joel. Yeah, yeah thank you. All right, um, our final speaker for today is Mr. Bharat Agarwal. Bharat right, is the president of uh, Vishwakarma University and Vishwakarma Institute Group. He has led the progress of a group into multiple business verticals, such as education, retail, manufacturing, and publishing. The Vishwakarma Group houses 15 educational institutions comprising of engineering, management, marine, science, and value address programs that has enrollment of 25,000 students and more than 2,200 full-time employees. Under his leadership, the premier flagship institute, the Visual Trauma Institute of Technology, has become the first autonomous engineering institution in the state of Maharashtra. Mr. Bharat is also an executive member of the Maratha Chamber of Commerce, Industries and Agriculture, and he also chairs the higher, the higher education committee of the same. Mr. Bharat, the final honor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon from India. I'm sure it is late evening in the Singapore and East Asia, so good evening to everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be over here. It was an honor to listen to Professor Anil Sasrabuddhi from AICT in India. It was an honor to listen and learn from other speakers uh, on this panel. Foremost, let me thank uh, the organizers of this webinar for inviting me to speak. And uh, Mr. Rahul Jain, who is a, a friend who initiated me as a speaker on this particular panel. I represent Vishwadharma University as the president. We are located in the city of Pune, which is in the western part of India, about three hours drive from Mumbai, one of the large cities in India with a population of more than six million people. Just to introduce uh, the group, uh, Vishwadharma group is uh, largely known for its two engineering colleges, the Vishwadharma Institute of Technology, the flagship brand, uh, Vishwatharma Institute of Information Technology, VIIT. So both the colleges uh, are NBA and NAT accredited and ranked by NIRF, uh, Government of India. The Vishwatharma University, established three years back, uh, has schools of engineering, management, humanities, design, pharmacy, and so on. We have 10 kindergarten to standard 12 schools. We have a graduate college uh, offering the commerce, science, and management programs called VCACS. In all, we have around 25,000 full-time on-campus students. Uh, we also, as a business group, are diversified into manufacturing, retail, and have today 2,200 employees. The teaching and pedagogy at our group uh, for almost the last three years has been that we wanted to digitize our operations as much as possible. We got engaged very early with uh, 
uh, company Eduplus Campus and developed a learning management system called VOLP. We have been deploying the system effectively for the last uh, three plus years. There was good adaptation from students. There were challenges of adaptation of the same from uh, teachers, I would say, for some time. This COVID movement has, of course, fast forwarded the entire process of uh, adaptation of digitization of education, and all our teachers have moved online. The students were already online. We always had been using flipped classroom and project based learning as two important tools or methodologies of education, of, of uh, teaching learning. Flipped classroom, as we all have learned before through other speakers also, primarily means the student under those theory education at home, and in class he is involved into discussions or problem solving with needs. PBL, project-based learning, there is a problem statement coming from the faculty or from the industry which a student applies using his theory knowledge, his practical knowledge to solve it. Assessments form an important part of the pedagogy. Uh, we have been ensuring 60 degrees assessments, which means not only is his knowledge tested, but also his uh, application of knowledge, his personality, his teaching, his speaking skills, his presenting skills, everything is tested in the entire year. We encourage a lot of teamwork. So a lot of uh, credit is given to students when they are uh, doing the particular project in a team or they are presenting a particular seminar in a team and so on. And they are also graded for teamwork. There is credits given to students for his personality and character development. So there are courses that uh, the student has to do in campus and further that are also assessed. And lastly and more importantly, we have been having innovation driven courses. So students have to do a project every semester. They have to publish a paper on the project and they also have to try to file patents and other intellectual property uh, around it uh, in, some, in some form or the other. Well, the Government of India, uh, Professor Anil leads an uh, important council to the ICTE. Other than that, there are other uh, central councils. The state governments, like we are in the state, must also have its own, have its own regulations, institutes for colleges for Largely, in the, uh, higher education system is, is, is in three buckets. The first bucket is of affiliated colleges, which are affiliated to a central government university or a state government university. Then there are autonomous colleges, which have and which have the authority to design, develop curriculum content, but still they are affiliated to a government university. And then there are private universities and government universities. The government generally regulates the intake of students, the admissions, and fee structure for the affiliated and autonomous colleges. The private universities have enough authority to be innovative in course design and pedagogy. Of course, uh, the government of India has been largely promoting blended education for a long time now, and have been also promoting institutes, universities to take industry participation in their in their operations. Well, uh, the impact of COVID, uh, I mentioned a few minutes back that we have been largely implementing or I would say deploying digitization of our teaching and learning for the last three years. So when COVID hit and uh, hit, hit us in Pune, the first in India, we went uh, under lockdown maybe in the mid of March. We had a seamless and a quick transition to online education. It was synchronous as was mentioned by one of the early speakers. Most of the teachers, I would say almost all teachers with a gap of four or five days went online using the VOLP system, using Zoom and Google Meets and other, other online conferencing tools and transitioned the teaching learning into an online mode. Both students and uh, parents, students and teachers, they were positive response to this. All the theory classes happened online, assessments happened online and uh, not only the assessments happened through multiple choice questions or through um, or through some simple other uh, assessment patterns, but there was also group work which was assessed. We also were able to engage parents very effectively during the during the COVID situation because parents were also home, and so it was very effective to use the same platform of ULP as well as Zoom to communicate with the parents, engage with them, take feedback, give them updates about our progress and our, our activities and initiatives. We also arranged a lot of uh, talks from industry experts to our students and to our teachers effectively during the last 
one and a half months. Post pandemic, we do hope and pray that we come out of the situation at the earliest. We are allowed to open. Safety and health remains a top priority now. So we do understand that at least for some time, maybe six months, maybe a year, we would have to engage, employ a lot of practices in the campus which are uh, more health and safety oriented and might result in a low attendance on campus because distancing and hygiene has to be maintained as a top priority. We believe theory has to be continued to be taught online. Uh, lab work, remedial teaching will happen on campus. In this sense, the student may visit a classroom only one or two days in a week. The remainder three, four days, he is on uh, his uh, hostel room, his dormitory room, or his home from wherein he will be engaged in theory classes. Uh, collaboration tools, uh, we believe so far the LMS has served the good purpose of at least uh, the classrooms being formed, the lectures being held, the assignments being delivered, and assessments being held. But we believe further, a lot of collaboration tools have to be built in the LMS. We cannot replicate the fun of campus at home. I'm sure none of us can do that. Because campus life is uh, about education, is about growth, is about learning. But it also is not about fun. It is about camaraderie with your fellow students. It is about building a relationship with your teachers. All these things will be missed. What we can at most do is to build some tools in the LMS so that we at least have some experiences of collaboration otherwise. We also believe that assessments have to be spread and have to be innovative. By spread, I mean in the early systems, we generally had assessments or uh, end semester exam as an event. And uh, like this year, the event was in March. Uh, for us in engineering education, the event was in May. And we were in lockdown during these phases. So almost the entire end semester examinations were wiped out. We believe further going, we would have to spread our assessments. And uh, we also have to innovate our assessments so that we comprehensively are able to assess students. More and more projects have to be delivered, uh, have to be around digitization because that would be the need of the industry outside, of consultancy firms, of manufacturing firms, of service firms. We also foresee a lot of e-internships to be given to students. So physical internships are, of course, more fruitful, but then going forward, e-internships is something that we foresee to pick up. The fourth plus remains on blended learning. The fourth plus, of course, now also moves towards association with industries for setting up centers of excellence. Like us, all the industries are going through a disruption. Many manufacturing units are working with less workforce. They want to digitize their operations quickly, quicker than ever. Various service models of various companies is undergoing disruption. The entire travel industry is going under disruption. The experience industry, I would say, is going under disruption. So all these, uh, all these industries, all these companies would require some innovation and some, some new ideas to come up. It is good time for them to partner with universities like us, set up centers of excellence, and do collective or collaborative research and innovations around their practices and operations. Executive education is a push because uh, some of us, some of the employees may lose jobs. Uh, projects and innovation is something that has to be boosted now. And uh, we have to further enhance adaptation of the online mode of teaching and learning, and improvisations have to be carried on around that. The objective of all of us is success of our students. Uh, I'd like to quickly wrap up because uh, I've just run out of time. So success of students is something that is uh, our, our, our common ground through live projects from the industry. It's, I think, easier now ever than before because they themselves are innovating a lot. Technical competency of the of the students have to be enhanced. Innovative projects have to be driven. We have to also teach and uh, learn, teach and enable our students to work remotely and do teamwork remotely. Understanding stress levels, understanding uh, loneliness, understanding um, challenges of working from home or remote working. We might have to increase inclination towards arts, which means introduce music and other fine arts in our curriculum. This might just uh, fill the burden that is created because of remote working. We have to also pay attention towards mental health through meditation and yoga inbuilt in our curriculum. Physical health uh, is a bit challenged because locked in apartment, not allowed to move around uh, too much, sports being curtailed, 
we have to again improvise and uh, we have to think of you know, ways in which we can keep ourselves and our students physically fit. Last, international associations is something that uh, we have to foster because student movement internationally will also be challenged. I am sure through online collaborative tools, we are, through online, through the learning management systems and Zooms of the world, we can enhance faculty exchanges and e-internships for students. I like to end uh, over here. Thank you so much. Uh, I once again am grateful to the organizers for inviting me to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bharat. Um, we are now open to the Q&A session, and we have received a overwhelming response. So what we'll, we will not be able to address all the questions in this session. So what we'll do is that we'll try to answer as much as we can. And those that we can't, we will follow up with you through an email after the webinar. Uh, Joel, Joel. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just, just a short interruption. I would just like to take a few minutes um, to thank uh, Professor Anil for staying with us throughout until this time. Uh, somebody, uh, where you are, I'm sure you're very busy, and I really appreciate you staying, uh, staying throughout. And. And also, not just today, but also the other day, you were saying, staying throughout my talk and really appreciate it. I do have a question before I let you go. Um, so this, may I ask the question, Professor Anil? Absolutely, you can ask. Yes, yes, okay. So, um, okay, the transformation involved, in fact, two sort of parallel track interrelated and one part of it clearly is not a choice and we all have to do that all the academia coming out they are they have done that before or they are doing it now it's about changing the mode of learning which is really from offline to blended essentially that's one part of it the second part uh, is really about applied learning the applied learning is uh, is beyond just uh, pedagogy changes, right? Uh, integrating work into the journey, but really is also about the needs to set up that ecosystem to support applied learning, such as bringing employer into the hiring process. So over the last months or so, while I'm interacting with uh, the India University, one of the present surprise that I'm getting is that, in fact, regulation, uh, they are not as much constraint put on the university, what they can do, because a lot of the, they are awarded certain status and the, they have to, of course, certain guidelines in terms of how they would do their learning. Um, and therefore, I think um, for you, for India to actually move forward and um, to transform to a more flexible type of learning would probably be less constrained to do so compared to, uh, including Singapore, I think. Yeah. So my question is that on applied learning, um, can you enlighten us with some direction in terms of are you going that direction? Because when I read the paper, I read something about competency learning uh, recently that been part of what been moved to the market appreciate if you can share some uh, some direction on that for india yeah thank you very much leslie uh, there are a couple of things which i would like to mention which i had not uh, talked during the, my my talk you know there was limited time available so let me start with uh, the uh, experiential learning part of it Students have been made mandatorily to undertake internship of minimum six months time in an engineering curriculum of four years. And similarly, about three months for a postgraduate program, whether it is in engineering or management. So this has been made mandatory. So naturally, every institution is required to sign MOUs with at least five industries in the neighborhood, wherever they want, and then find opportunities. But still, in the tier two, tier three, smaller places, they had challenges in engagement with industry. So we have created an internship portal, you know, a massive portal. There are more than a, uh, you know, quarter of a million opportunities for internships made available through the AICT portal. 
mean, not only that, the Honorable Finance Minister this time announced that there will be a budgetary provision for giving stipends to students during internship. And therefore, many ministries are coming forward to have engagement with the ICT providing this. There are about 100 odd smart cities, for example. Ministry of uh, Housing and Urban Affairs has come forward and said from local administration to smart cities, uh, there will be hundreds of opportunities at every small district level. And all of them would be available for students in terms of getting first hand practical exposure. Similarly, the Ministry of uh, Road Transport, you know, one who takes care of highways, they have come forward for giving that, uh, you know, internship opportunities, Ministry of Small and Medium Scale Industry. I, I think I can go on. So the one part is students get ample opportunity to undertake experiential learning through an industry uh, interaction. The second one, uh, more interesting, I would like to deal with is probably I don't know whether in Singapore that system exists. I have not heard of it in anywhere in the world probably. Is that for any faculty member when he is in the earlier years, you know, when he is young and joins the profession of teaching, we have made eight module teacher certification program mandatory in technical So what it means is a teacher, when he enters the profession of teaching, he has to go through that eight modules to become a regular faculty. Otherwise, he will not have uh, permanence in his job. He will have to be, you know, if he does not do it within three or four years, he will have to quit the job. He is not uh, successful as a teacher, actually. So in these eight modules, some of the things which are very really interesting are exactly linked with what we are all talking about today. Uh, first thing is passion about teaching. See, the, that passion is most important. How do you develop that? You start from there, passion about engineering itself, and then subsequently as you go along, uh, whether it is uh, use of ICT, that is technology, whether it is uh, most platforms, uh, learning management systems, how do you use it effectively in order to have a very good contact with the students? You know, that is uh, another model. Curriculum revision is another model. Examination reforms is, is another model. Everyone has to learn about examination reforms because uh, the road level has to be moved away and then we want uh, our students to have uh, all the knowledge in terms of understanding, application, uh, the uh, well, uh, innovation, all of that has to come in. So I think that is also another thing. The faculty to involve in this is also important. So that also is going to be part of that. Then uh, you have Innovation is an important item that we have to go through innovation as well. And how uh, one can really transform and keep changing as per the requirements and also values, ethics. So I think these are eight modules, including your university administration. So you need to rise in the hierarchy, you will become someday head of the department, dean, uh, divisional chairman, vice chairman, vice chancellor, director, whatever. So that training is also given right from the inception. So I think these are some of the very important things. And this is not enough. Having gone through this, every faculty member has to go to industry for four weeks for internship. Uh, students are going anyway, but faculty also has to go and they have to understand the nuances of latest things happening in the industry and bring it back to the academic institution. And all that they have learned in eight modules and the industry have to practice in the college. When a senior faculty will monitor them and then give a satisfactory or unsatisfactory remark based on which they will get regularized. And this is not enough for them to promote to higher level, that is from assistant professor to associate professor or from associate to a full professor. Again, we have several other modules and industry internship mandatory intermittently as well. I think this is where the uh, problem of the university and the society will be brought to the classroom while teaching every subject. Uh, and then the use of ICT, the technology, whether it is internet based or whether it is MOOC based, how do you engage students in the blended learning in uh, flipped classrooms? This is also being part of the training program. And without that, they will not progress in their profession at all. I, I think we have to change. All right. Yeah, I think appreciate it. Thank you. Um, clearly, I think this is quite unique. I didn't think that uh, faculty elsewhere have to gone through that type of technical grounding. And and I come from the school that I think six years old should learn how to code. And I think that coding is actually part of uh, core skill required for 
every individual because it's not about really the technical piece. It's really about the problem solving, the way you think if you are a coder. So really appreciate that. I think uh, that insight into actually the development of the education system, actually starting from getting the lecturer actually been able to do experiential uh, learning, delivery that effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, actually, I have a follow-up question. Sorry, Joel. In fact, I want to ask Claire on this. Uh, sim similar line of thought, similar, li similar line. Um, applied learning clearly um, is getting popular in Asia and there are countries that are moving toward that. Uh, but they've been actually not so much success, not much success. Uh, China, for example, actually the five years ago, we talked, we heard about this university need to be transformed to become applied science university in China because uh, so, but really three years, four years later on, we still hear about this initiative. Uh, clearly, I think they are having issue because uh, fundamental to applied learning is actually your curriculum, right? It need to be really competency based. It need to be skill based as a foundation. So, um, but for UK, right? Um, I haven't been closely in touch, but I started to see a lot more program that actually include internship as mandatory component, a big component. So I thought maybe Claire can shed some light on uh, applied learning in UK. Thank you, Leslie. I'd be very happy to do that. Um, there are several strands, I think, to the development of applied learning in the UK, one of which is the embedding of what we describe as employability skills in the curriculum, whatever the subject, um, from English literature, drama, history, through to biomedical sciences, um, business and computing and technology, so that our students are um, employer or employer ready, uh, business ready when they leave the university. And that involves um, internships, work experience. Some of those are quite short periods of work experience. Some of them are longer. Uh, for example, at Roehampton, our undergraduate business programs now offer a one year internship uh, between the second and third year. And we offer that now at master's level as well with a two year master's. Uh, but much of it is also really embedded in the more general curriculum. Uh, and we've looked at how we design, for example, our assessments to ensure that they uh, are useful to students in, in the uh, world of work. So uh, they may uh, design pitches to clients or uh, they may uh, write pieces for uh, commercial radio or they may um, uh, do, do assessments that help them to uh, set out their skills for employers when they leave the university. So there's an element of embedding within the cur curriculum and of engaging both locally and nationally with business and uh, other organisations to uh, enable students to, to gain experience uh, while they're studying, although certainly at Roehampton many of our students are working in any case alongside their study. Um, and that means that they, uh, we know that that enhances their opportunities in employment when they leave the university. I think the second thing is that the government has an agenda to uh, develop the apprenticeship offer much uh, more uh, broadly. So currently uh, this uh, work-based vocational learning is very prevalent up to the age of 16 and 18 and has been expanded into the higher education area so that we have a number of apprenticeship, degree apprenticeships and higher apprenticeships where students can learn uh, in work. They have uh, one day, a requirement for 20%, one day a week equivalent, 20% of their time off the job in terms of um, more uh, classroom based or online learning, but they are mainly working in the workplace. Uh, and those um, uh, are then funded by uh, a levy, a tax which is placed on employers. 
Uh, and so that uh, is also a way of ensuring that um, employers are uh, upskilling their workforce uh, and students have the opportunity not only to gain the practical applied skills, but also an academic award alongside of that. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Joel, you want to take over from there? Sure, certainly. We have a couple of questions from the uh, audience. So let me just go to Dr. Lili Chan first. Dr. Chan. Um, the question from the audience is, please share with us your challenges working with the local authorities in getting funding and approval for the blended program, the one that you mentioned three years of working, all right? So they, the audience want to know how do you get this approved through the authorities and how do you actually overcome it? Um, okay, just to be clear, we are an ODL, meaning a open distance learning university. So our license allows us to do that. So um, to be fair, this was all done before my time, um, and um, a lot of this was, um, we have currently about 60 programs that are accredited in our university. And all these were done over the last 13 years. Um, obviously, we have a QA team that handles all this. And, um, and because the university license is different, it's not a face-to-face -face intensive license. So there was a lot, that there was flexibility within the constraints of Malaysia's um, various program structures that are allowed. So, so um, the, the exams and assignments, for instance, we can provide assessments via assignments, via online quizzes, um, and obviously you do need a final exam. And, the flexibility is a certain percentage of your final exam weightage on the course. So, so in a sense, um, the flexibility is there because of the license that we hold. One of the challenges if today you go on to apply for this, um, if the university wants to go fully on an online system, you would need to apply for a university license in Malaysia. All the uh, 400 colleges and university in the private sector in Malaysia, all of them have to go through this process of getting a license to operate in Malaysia. Um, like every accreditation, it is, it is a process, right? But if you know how to fulfill all the relevant criteria, you can get through pretty quickly. It, it's not as difficult as it, as it sounds um, because we, we have gone through it. So it isn't. In the new program that we are doing, we are in the process of submitting. One cannot recruit students until you get um, accreditation, a, a provisional accreditation. So we have to go through that process um, before we can launch our program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay, thank you. I mean, you can, you can write to me directly. Um, okay. Yeah. Joel will be able to provide you my email, and you can write to me directly. Yeah? All right. Thank you. Okay, the next question actually is addressed to uh, Professor Anil. So, Professor, the question is, India is one of the biggest exporters for software talent to date. So, what is your vision to continue to drive that momentum? That's part one of the question. What does that drive, drive them? Continue to drive this momentum to be one of the software talent platform, talent exporter in the world. So that's part one of the question. Part two of the question is about digital business and marketing talent. Do you have any plan? What is the vision in seeing that that is an emerging market as well? How would that play up in the marketplace and your position for India? I think both are in some way connected. In fact, uh, the lead which India took in terms of uh, IT revolution, thanks to many companies who cropped up, whether it is Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, Vipro, Cognizant, I can roll out. Each one of them is a billion dollar industry and uh, they all started in the late 80s and 90s. And today, the routine software writing is not good enough. So we must have 
embedment of uh, whether it is uh, AI, IoT, machine learning into the programming skill sets as well, and only then they can succeed. And that's why many of these uh, organizations where people were writing codes based on the old era are no more uh, required. And therefore, unless they continue to have reskilling, so one is uh, upskilling and reskilling is also very, very important. And that is a big drive which IT industry is already doing. And any new well, uh, you know, person who is welcomed into the organization from the colleges, they are already trained in that. I, I think, therefore, the edge which uh, India had will continue to be there in the new uh, normal as well. As far as the digital marketing is concerned, there are many spe specializations where digital marketing is there. Plus, most importantly, data analytics is also important. In many management schools today, we have data man uh, analytics as one of the specializations. And this is significant because uh, to drive the market, a lot of information is required to be filtered. Then uh, you understand that in the nuances for how the customer is behaving. And using data analytics, digital marketing can be successful. So it is the marriage between new technologies and the routine marketing strategies. You know, both have to work together. And some, uh, you know, management schools have started adopting this. I'm sure uh, many more will start adopting it later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question actually is directed to uh, Mr. Barak. So also two part of the question. Because you have shown tremendous success in actually spearheading multiple businesses and faculties, um, at the same time also very innovative in terms of building faculties and disciplines. So the question to you is that um, with the current pandemic situation, do you have a plan to actually provide financial scheme for students who are actually will be even in an even bigger financial difficulties post pandemic? That's one part. So basically, how do you continue to actually allow students in your in your schools in institutions, you know, to actually afford the fee? That's one part. Another part is that what is the plan in terms of gearing up uh, also in digital business faculty? Right. Thank you so much. Uh, the first part of the question is that, uh, as I understand, what are the uh, financial uh, schemes that we might have so that students can afford to continue their education in spite of them facing a the lot of challenges around money? Uh, well, we all are in, uh, in this challenging position right now where we have to balance uh, our uh, priorities. We have to, re I would say, restate our priorities. Uh, because we all have got into a mode where we are only living with the essentials and living for essentials, a lot of luxuries has been shut down. As you believe, education is still a priority and is a necessity. Uh, investing in yourself is the best investment that you can do in today uh, in, in today's scenario. But empathizing with parents and uh, in general with all the students, we have decided that we will not be enforcing any end date for a student to pay up the tuition fees. See, we are a private university, and for a private university, tuition fees is the only source of funding for the entire college system, for the entire university system. So it's through tuition fees as the income that the expenditure towards salaries and to other infrastructure is met. We want to engage in developing, in delivering high quality education for which we have to keep on innovating and improving our teachers and experimenting with a few new modes of teaching learning pedagogies and also collaborations with industries and other universities. Thus, tuition fees becomes very important to us. But we have done away with the deadline that we a student has to pay up before a particular date, only then he can be enrolled to a semester. So registration has been delinked with his ability or his payment uh, of fees. Second, we are Getting in touch with every student about uh, when is it possible for him likely to make a, make a payment for fees and we are not being aggressive at all with the collections. One, I would say, different mode has uh, emerged. It is It was not an innovation from our side, but uh, it has just emerged this. Very recently, about two months back, when this first time COVID hit and we had our alumni meet online, we just made an appeal to all the alumni that this is the time when the institute would need collaborations with alumni more than ever and contributions from alumni more than ever. We do understand alumni being alumni, they would like to go back to the alma mater. The institute does not need money to build its buildings. It already has done that. 
what it needs money is to fund these students. I am very happy to announce that a lot of alumni has now come forward. They have formed association and now the one of the important priority objectives of the association is to fund student fees. Of course, there would be a screening process for students to undergo the pro, to undergo selection under this scheme from alumni. I'm sure many financially distressed students will find uh, will find uh, help from contributions from the alumni as well as we will be empathizing with them and we will not be forcing them to pay up on time. We would be just uh, uh, held, holding their hand toward uh, the, in, the, in this journey. About digital business, I think so every business is now digital business. Uh, we all uh, have been teaching courses digitally. We have been engaging in the business digitally. So digital business is very much part of our content curriculum. There have been now innovations where you have started even teaching dance and music digitally and online through Zoom. I am sure uh, a faculty, we have a faculty of music where we have students learning Hindustani, which is Indian music as well as music from uh, or Western music, I would say, uh, as a course as a course content. We have been experimenting with teaching music online and it has also given us some learnings and also some success. I'm sure the way forward is digitized business. We are investing in creating good content and thus good students who can take ahead this flag of digital business in future years. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Barad. Um, next question is to uh, Ms. Sandy. Okay, so the question is um, like, like you said, top universities in the world are now pressured to reduce tuition fees significantly. In fact, um, many are already going into debt, like even Harvard University is going to debt. So what do you think is the advantage for university in this part of the region? And what do you think they should do right now? Um, okay, thank you for the question. Um, I would say this is a very tough time for um, higher education institutions, especially in Indonesia where um, there's no student loan, um, there's no well-established student loan systems. And um, so every student who, uh, who are going to university will have to find them by themselves or by their parents. Um, I think we can reduce the cost of education significantly by um, with online classes, yeah, but of course we have, like I previously mentioned, we need to be careful about the provision um, because if we are too massive, it will be like MOOCs where um, there will be low level of completion. This is also something that Leslie mentioned as well. So we need to be, uh, we need to recreate our online courses so that it's more balanced. So uh, the students who go for online classes will still be able to complete the course without having to uh, to pay a very high tuition fee. And also the, um, the earn and learn model is actually very good. Um, so students can work part-time or work full-time and study part-time yeah, so that we can give them this, this option as well so that they will be able to fund their study um, in a much easier way. Um, and we need to pay attention to the adult learners as well. This is a very growing market and um, these adult learners are people who are working full time and or housewives who uh, who have their hands full actually, but they would still love to uh, to take a university degree or study for a master's degree. And I think this is also another opportunity for us to um, brace the current crisis. I hope that would answer it. Um, yes, I believe so. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. There's another question, but I believe this question is more open to the entire panel. It doesn't yeah. direct to any specific person. Mm -hmm. So the question um, is, with COVID-driven disruption in the current situation, do you think international collaborative degree, and this is where uh, Professor Claire can come in as well, do you think international collaborative degree can emerge and it will benefit all the stakeholders, creating a win-win solution for everybody? Uh, definitely. I think that would be good. That would, that's a great idea. I also agree. Yeah, this is Lily. I also agree. 
And, and I think um, universities like ours have gone through this distance learning concept and, and understand how the pedagogy of um, how to put curriculum and courses together and all that. We, we, we are happy to collaborate. And this is this is Claire speaking. Yes, I think uh, I also agree, and I think that those kinds of collaborations not only benefit uh, the institutions in terms of shared experience, but also the students because they have opportunities to share their experience of work and study with one another uh, across uh, continents, and that's uh, a huge benefit. Uh, in terms of developing their skills and their networks uh, for the students. That brings in another question, actually, specifically targeting. Uh, uh, jo Joel, uh, I would like to just uh, pitch in oh, here. Sure. I have to go off now for some other meeting. Okay. Uh, this question was very interesting, and I would like to state that already many universities do have collaboration MOUs whereby students' exchange take place for one semester, one year, and so on and transfer of credits do take place. So what right now, University Grants Commission and uh, MHRD had set up a committee to evaluate a possibility of having what is known as uh, credit banking. Uh, like our bank accounts, why not have every student credit account where uh, he may do courses from any source, any university, and goes on accumulating the credits. And as soon as he completes the number of credits required for the Award of a degree, a degree may be probably allotted. So I think it's a very innovative idea, but I don't know how credit definition will have to be uniform across the board. Uh, if people have to uh, agree to respect the courses of another university. I think so many things are going to happen. So I think it is a very innovative idea being uh, pitched here, and some meetings have already been held in India. Thank you very much. That's an interesting idea as well. Um, so this this question actually leads to another question that's actually targeting at uh, Professor Claire. That is, um, you mentioned a lot about inclusivity um, as well as remote in your presentation. So do you have a plan to actually include Asia into your global vision? Um, so it ties in very well with talking about this collaboration uh, degree is emerging. And so what is the plan to stay competitive and your arrangement with anyone in Asia? So, so thank you for, for that question. Um, uh, I think there are many ways which we can collaborate uh, with uh, colleagues and, and partner institutions in, in Asia, both in terms of the more traditional franchise and validation uh, arrangements. Uh, but also in creating joint programs uh, where uh, students from across the world can benefit from the expertise uh, in uh, and bring that uh, to their uh, future careers. So certainly Roehampton itself, uh, located in London, but reaching out to, to the world, um, really is looking forward to opportunities to, to collaborate with institutions where we can both bring something new and something different to the table um, and create some uh, innovative ways of working in partnership. Thank you. So um, the speakers have agreed that collaboration, collaborative degree is the way to go. Um, so the next question pertaining to that is that how do we then convince our administrators, our university administrator, that this is the right way to go, and this is a structured program that would definitely benefit our students. Any advice from the speakers? Hello. Hi. So, um, sorry. I was uh, suddenly there's a there's a guest. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question? Sure, sure. This question is open to all the speakers. Mm -hmm. So everybody agrees about collaborative degree is the way to go, and also this credit banking interchangeable mm -hmm. program is the right way that will benefit the students. But how do we then convince the university administrator that this kind of structure is the right way that will help the students? 
Okay, I I personally think that it's going to be tough, but um, because um, every university will have their own um, their own uniqueness and strength and. They will insist that probably this particular subject is really not the same with the others, uh, but I think we need to remind them that uh, our students would probably benefit a lot from um, this collaborative degree because uh, they will be able to see a different perspective and they'll be able to go to um, an overseas university and much easier, uh, less dramatic in terms of the credit transfer um, issues. So I would say that. Uh, to convince them, we'll take them to, uh, we need to really tell them the benefits and why we're doing this and why they should participate in it. And it's not going to be easy. Um, any other speakers? Um, Leslie here, I'll jump in <laughs> just for a while. So one, one of the strategy, right, to create this regional learning and talent platform, which would include many of the university in the region, perhaps even around the world, that we can collaboratively provide that learning journey that enable them to be structuring across different geography, um, so, so that was one of the, the reasons that we are trying to pull together different partners, uh, not just local Asian partner, but also international partner that who would be able to come together and have certain standard in terms of the way that we learn as well as the way that we deliver and the goal if we all agree that at the end of the day is to deliver a work already graduate, is to deliver uh, skills, then I think collectively we could actually have this interchangeably of credential or joint credentials that enable the learner to not just get that credential, but also the experience, the consistent experience that allow them to be a global ready talent. Oh, I'd like to, sorry, I'd like to add in a bit. I just had the idea. Uh, we were talking about the ASEAN Economic Community um, this several, several years. I think if we want to convince the administrator, we can use that as a, a way to convince them that now the ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nations have to move together and we have to become a solid economy. Yep. And this is the right time for them to do that. And therefore we need to synergize. I think that's all from me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's a very big and bold initiative. That's good to hear. So this coming back, because of time constraint, I would just ask one last question. And this question is actually targeting uh, at uh, Leslie. So the question is that how does Les how does Nissan work with universities or department, and what are the requirements as well as the procedures to enter into an agreement based on the business model that you have said? Okay, so. Essentially, I think we have certain strength. Uh, we have invested significantly in certain curriculum and we have curated as well uh, certain delivery capability, which include industry practitioner, mentor. And what we hope to do is to be able to combine with the local, local reach within each of this uh, country and therefore able to put up this offering to the market quickly. So, so, the, so we said that we could do that in 90 days, uh, essentially because the, co the content, the delivery, um, we could provide that. And the university, that's why depending on different countries, some country like Malaysia as an example, that courses would need to be accredited, uh, would need to be um, by the local re uh, regulatory body. But there are many countries that don't need that, like Indonesia, like India. Uh, so these are countries that effectively, the decision really rests with the university. If the university felt that this is what they want to do and they want to offer that in September, um, it could be done almost immediately. So 
we would go into a revenue split arrangement on that basis to 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 start the relationship. Um, so that's why we are having this webinar. Um, therefore, uh, enter into discussion in terms of how we can actually uh, collaborate. So, um, so if so, we certainly want to to also make sure that the local institution. Uh, share the same view from us because our view is very clear because we are not just out there providing training we are actually providing we have an ecosystem that delivers that job as well to the learner and so the curriculum the delivery and the job placement ability uh, which is which is will be offered by Singapore company who are going to offshore their talent overseas in this 10 country and with that i think the applied learning pathway and the heavy lifting so-called is sort of done it's really about bringing this to the audience in the country and we want to make sure that the university that we can work with share that view in terms of bringing that outcome to the learner more importantly the credential and the trust that the institution have would allow us to support the customer journey uh, to that objective. All right, thank you. And thank you for the, the panel for the Q&A session. Leslie, can I hand over the uh, ending to you? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, oh, this session, I couldn't have thought that it's possible three months ago, right? Uh, we spent like two and a half weeks to put, to in fact have about four, 500 people attending the, the class. And it took me three days to pull together the, the panel that are involved. Um, and really thank you for coming on in sh short notice, uh, Professor Anil, Sandy, Claire, Lily, Bharat, Giri, and John Yen uh, for coming on board and spending a few hours with us. Um, and really appreciate that. Um, we, in order to go to market in two weeks, certainly we can't do it on our own. We work with partner, um, for example, ASMA. We couldn't have done it without ASMA. ASMA um, is, our, is our partner agency that, uh, that worked with us to outreach to university uh, in India. In fact, the half of the attendee, I assume, would actually come from India. So, um, so thank you very much, Rahu. Rahu is an old friend. Uh, in fact, we used to work together many years back. We kept in touch and two, three weeks ago, and he received a WhatsApp for me. And uh, I said, can we get this done in a couple of weeks? Uh, so I'm really glad that uh, he played a big part in actually bringing the audience on board uh, in such short notice. Um, I think Indonesia as well. I think we have quite a few attendees from Indonesia. Um, so really appreciate the partner that who bring us the, the audience as well. Um, so so um, follow. So our email is all there. I mean, if there's anything, and we'll reach out to you. Um, if you have something more specific. Uh, put in an email, we can, we'll get in touch with you. We can move to the next slide, let's see. Slide two. Oh. Okay. So, um, we are in all this country, right? Almost every country in Southeast Asia, plus in Indian subcontinent, we are present in Sri Lanka as well as India. And these are our country manager that you can get in touch with. To, to know more. Uh, perhaps if you're interested in collaboration, happy to certainly uh, talk to you more. Sure. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time uh, with us. Thank you everyone. Thank you for our panelists. Thank you organizers. Thank you everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.